Chet. Yo, yo, he's got a chef nice. now. Yo, yeah. is that what happens? Do you, you debate Ben Shapiro and you get chef money? Listen, now? if I'm gonna <laughs> spend money on anything, it might as well be food, right? Oh, yes, yeah, Roman, Roman Finkel, Steve bro, probably lost the bet. That's got actually money like that. Damn. Ball, Shout out to Destiny. All right, guys, we are live. So we got a pretty epic debate panel for you today. Uh, and what's cool about this one is that pretty much everyone on here is pretty logical and reasonable and smart. So I don't think there's going to be any crazy shouting, but you never know what's going to happen. So on the left, we got Michael Sartain. He's been on his channel a bazillion times. Uh, no intro necessary. Corey, you have been here on, on here only once. So why don't you go right. a little quick intro who you are and uh, what you do? Uh, yeah, cool. well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me on. Super appreciate it. Uh, I'm Corey Campbell. Uh, I'm a biochemist. I'm an actual scientist. You can find me on Twitch, uh, Corey Campbell 84, uh, Twitter, X, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, it's Corey Campbell. And yeah, thanks so much. For sure. And so you are a PhD student or? Uh, a PhD candidate, correct. Okay, awesome. Uh, Destiny's been on here a million times, of course, no introduction. He's fresh off the battlefield of debating uh, Norman Filkenstein. We're all looking forward to watching a debate drop. Uh, it's going to be uh, quite exciting. And uh, Homath, Homath, you've been on here a few times, so mm -hmm. why don't you give a quick intro as well? Um, I, how do I introduce myself? Um, I went to school. I have a uh, ability to communicate things to people that they appreciate quite a bit. I have taken off pretty quickly in the last year. Um, I make charts that explain things to people in ways that are easy for them to understand, and they like it. That's what I do. Yeah, you can change your name to whole chart. I think it'll be a little bit more appropriate. I could. I have to figure something out, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. So the topic of here is going to be Evo Psych, where we're discussing how evolution psychology specifically relates to dating and relationships and gender dynamics and stuff like that. Uh, now, as far as I understand, Michael Sartain and Whole Math are gender. Well, actually, I'm not going to even try to sum up anyone's well, position. Well, I'll just I think, think Whole Math, Whole Math, you specialize. You went to a graduate school for developmental psychology, not evolutionary psychology. That's right. Yeah. So I think the, the good way to do it will be, I'll I'll start off, Michael, if you don't mind going first, I'll start off with you. I'll give you a chance to, uh, I guess, kind of explain your, just your opening statement about how you feel about uh, Evo Psych as it relates to dating and dynamics. Just kind of outline your general philosophy on the table in like less than two minutes. Uh, and then I think we'll go to Corey uh, and then we'll go to Whole Math and then we'll go to Destiny. So we'll kind of keep an alternating order. So this way you guys can address what other person saying in your opening statements if you want. After that, it'll just be uh, open uh, open panel. I'm not really going to participate much. Uh, in fact, my mom's going to be watching this from the background. She might stop by and say hi. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're looking forward to this. And, uh, yeah, you guys won't hear from me much unless, of course, someone is being interrupted so much they can't get a word in. Or I feel like I can ask an important question and move the conversation forward. But once again, the topic is Evo Psych is a race to dating and relationships. All right, Michael, kick it off. Yeah, so in the 1880s, Charles Darwin come up, comes up with the idea of natural selection. And for the next, you know, 150 some odd years, uh, the belief is that natural selection applies to animals and it applies to humans when it comes to their hands and their fingers and their feet. But the concept of natural selection applying to the brain did not come about probably until sociobiology and evolutionary psychology in the 1970s. And so the concept of evolutionary psychology is basically that almost all the proclivities that we have come from some adaptation that we needed in our ancestral past in order to survive. It doesn't make them wrong, right or wrong. It's not normative, it's just descriptive. And so in, the, in, in that we do, that, we have those descriptions, then what we can do is we can run tests, like for instance, on like hip to waist ratio or whether or not men or women are more interested in casual sex or, or how, how people uh, you know, cherish virginity, st stuff like that. And what we can do is run them over several different cultures and we can, uh, we can uh, select for or control for which one of these things are environmental and which one of these things are genetic. And then we can sort of see from that, hey, um, women tend to like men who are taller than them or like men who have more status or whatever. We can do studies on this. Now, once that happens is what's the practical application of it? For me, the number one most practical application or the number two is number one and two is sexy sons hypothesis and mate choice copying, which is the concept that if, if women like a man, then more women will like that man. We see that in several different species. Uh, and so that's one of the things, a great way for a man to be able to generate attraction is for other women to see that women are attracted to him. And that's a concept that's displayed. It's something I knew before I studied evolutionary psychology, but evolutionary psychology sorts of gives it a name and, and uh, you can actually see studies on it. Then furthermore, you know, why do people cheat? That's another thing that we can go over uh, from evolutionary psychology. So what are the reasons why that would happen? That'd be an interesting thing to, under, to, to discuss if you were talking about uh, dating. And then finally, like the concept of like status. 
uh, status hierarchies and how those affect people. And throughout history, we've seen that the men who had more status had more access to scarce resources and they had more access to sexual, you know, they had more access to fertility, more access to women. Um, and then the last one is, you know, this is just my personal belief. This is, this is uh, my opinion. I believe the apex for the human existence is either to have a family or to accomplish goals with other people. And in doing so, the men who were able to do that, those are the ones that had higher status. That's why we watch the Super Bowl, the World Cup. That's why, you know, people play soldier. That's why we do the, those kind of things. So in doing that, those men also have higher status, the ones that are able to accomplish goals of building a building or starting a company and things like that. So these are all concepts from evolutionary psychology, status, pre-selection, et cetera, that lead, uh, that correlate into dating. All right, cool. Corey, you're up. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I do need to be, to be pedantic because I'm a biologist. Uh, uh, Charles Darwin came up with evolution uh, in the 1850s, not the 1880s. As yeah, I'm sorry. It's 1859. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. The origin of species is 1859. On the uh, yeah. edition. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, I feel like I need to correct the record. You know what, uh, you know what it is? It, it's it's uh it's uh the uh what's his name? Uh, Isaac Newton's uh, Principia was written in 1689, and I got the, the numbers mixed up. It's my it's all, it's all good. Let's just like yeah. or get yeah. through. Go ahead. Uh, that's okay. Uh but yeah, uh so uh I think evolutionary psychology certainly has value as a field. I'm not an expert in evolutionary psychology, but I've read a lot of the research, uh, and I think it suffers from um, a lot of the same issues that a lot of these social sciences uh, suffer from in terms of replication uh, and a lot of sort of post hoc rationalization uh, or trying to, you know, fit a uh, square peg through a round hole uh, of like they seem to, I would say, rely on, you know, uh, mediocre, shoddy evidence. Um, and they have a hard time sort of explaining certain things. Uh, let's say I would be curious uh, to know evolutionary psychology's full explanation on, let's say, you know, adoption uh, and that behavior mm -hmm. or abortion, uh, et cetera, Altruism. et cetera. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. We can get into that. Pin selection. Yeah. Wait, yeah. Michael, Michael, this is the opening statement. <laughs> sorry. My bad. I'm oh, sorry. You're good. Uh, that's, it. that's it. Okay. Uh, let's go to whole math. So coming from coming into evolutionary psychology from developmental psychology perspective, the way that I'm looking at it is through uh, what, I, what is a, ph a phenomenological point of view. So the way that I process all of my evolutionary psychology uh, discussions, since you know I haven't studied it, I just read it in my spare time, is w what I do for people uh, in my you know in my making charts and explaining things and in my life coaching is I focus on the interiority, on the perspective of. The person that I'm working with or the person that I'm talking about when I make a video of somebody, I'm thinking about what that person is experiencing. I'm using, I guess, empathy in order to do that. The way that I connect that to evolutionary psychology is I have to imagine how these feelings arose in us over time and how we, through and uh, the process of evolution, learned to be the way that we are. Um, that is that's the way that I come at it. I don't know if I have as much to say about evolutionary psychology itself. I'm more commenting on it from the perspective of developmental psychology, which is uh, it unfolds in in a very specific way, in a very predictable way. So it's easy to tell where it's coming from once you know the system. All right, Destiny, you're up. Uh... Yeah, I feel like uh, people that lean in heavily into Evo Psych seem to hate literally every other soft science, and I think Evo Psych is probably one of the softest. I feel like if I was looking for uh, any sort of average human behavior across huge populations, you'd look at either polling data or you would look at like individual studies, but I don't know if I were to subscribe to like these widespread narratives that some people try to give to why men or women date or act in the ways that they do, because I feel like you're too prone to getting lost down a certain narrative pit fall. And then once you're stuck in that particular pitfall, it becomes really hard for you to accept or consider new data that might go contrary to the narrative that you've sort of bought into. So, I mean, I think that any scientific field is as good as the literature that it produces. And you would go by whatever particular studies you see, but I'd be really hesitant to, to subscribe to some all knowing or overarching theory that is supposed to be explanatory of all human, you know, social or sexual or whatever type of behavior. All right, awesome. So let's get into the open panel portion. Uh, so yeah, have at it, guys. Anyone who wants to kick it off first, feel free. Yeah, absolutely. So first off, dual mating strategy and mate switching strategy. So there have been, when new evidence is presented, uh, evolutionary psychologists do change their findings, number one. Number two, 
Corey, it is the most rigorously studied. Like their a level for rigor in their studies are actually higher than other science. I'll give you an example. For instance, the 0.68 to 0.72 hip to waist ratio. Not only is that replicated in several different cultures that have nothing to do with each other, they actually go back in time and they found that that, repli- that hip to waist ratio is preferred by men up to 3,000 years ago. And not only do they do that, bro, not only do they do that, they actually have blind men and they use haptics for blind men to describe which hip to waist ratio they like the best. And it's still 0.68 to 0.72. And when we do studies to find out what the most fertile women are, guess what hip to waist ratio they have? It's 0.68 to 0.72. So there's several different, now, could there be other reasons why? Or could it possibly be that evolution created us to where we prefer women who have the ability to, uh, to be healthier, right? We prefer women that have a sign to be healthier. That's one of them. I have like 50 others if you want. But this idea that there isn't testing for this, for instance, for like abortion, abortion would be like kin selection. I want, for instance, there's several instances in nature where we find when a child, like we see this with birds sometimes, the runt of the litter, they kick it out of the nest. This is sort of the same type of situation. If I have the ability to uh, to provide for one child and I can't provide for two, that's one of the reasons why you might find abortion, okay? But another thing you might find is that what is the most common, what is the highest predictability of child abuse? Do you know what it is, Corey? Uh, offhand, probably some history of child abuse, as in you probably no. abused as a child yourself. No, having a step-parent in the, fa- in the house. Having a step-parent in the house, it is 100x more likely that you're going to suffer from child abuse. And the reason why is because, again, that's not your genetics. And so that we see this over and over again. In fact, when they look at the studies, uh, previously when they looked at studies of child abuse, they didn't look, they didn't actually write down whether or not they were step-parents. Uh, Dr. David Buss does that in his book, uh, The Murderer Next Door, and he goes over infanticide. And that's where some of this stuff comes. So here's the thing. Is it, a, uh, like Destiny made a, the point, dude, it, I, the idea wait, of wait, wait. can I ask a quick question to... on that that yeah, thing that was just a very interesting step brought up a hundred times likelihood 100x. 100x so this would be my immediate assumption there'd be two th- two big questions I would have is that one anytime a step parent is involved you're already like wildly skewed off of ordinary family structure right because somebody's gotten divorced or broken up or there's an adopted well, I mean, child or something 50... If there's a 56% divorce rate, are you wildly skewed? You might be like right at the end of a standard deviation, but I don't think you're wildly skewed. I think we well, we 56% divorce rate. Well, what's the, I don't know what the divorce rate is for parents, and I'm pretty sure that right. like so, the baseline is considered having like a mom and a dad in the home is considered the baseline. So you'd compare from there, even if it wasn't uh, typical, even if it wasn't like 70, 80%. But but also again, yeah, that divorce rate. I don't know if that's if that's for parents. That's just divorce rate across all of society. I would imagine the divorce rate sure, is probably sure. higher for people with no kids, people with kids. But my second question would be because we, we immediately went to kin selection uh, as the ex- explain uh, as the explainer there. So one of the things that I said in my intro thing was that I'd be worried that people would get too hung up on a particular narrative and it would hurt their ability to analyze what's going on. My big question. Question would be to test and see, and I'm sure hopefully these guys have done this, if it's actual kin selection that's causing those step parents to be abusive to children, do you see the same type of abuse in households where infants were switched at birth? Because I know that this has happened before where at a hospital an infant could get switched. Is it possible that in those families, have people tracked that to see if those children were subject to more abuse because kin selection is going on there and it's operating mm-hmm. at like this genetic uh, evo psych level that people aren't even cognizant of? Or is the step parent yeah. thing actually red herring for all of the other broken aspects of a family that likely has other parents introduced into a child's life that's interesting yeah that's interesting well i don't know necessarily that you know when you have step parents uh, is the family more broken i guess maybe on on average it would be but no dude that's a great question and i don't know the answer to that as far as like children uh, switch at birth it reminds Uh, me a lot of uh uh, what happens a lot in nature as you see like with lions in particular i know they will kill the cubs of the previous lion after they and they fight them off and the females immediately go into estrus after they kill the cubs of the previous and that's been reported well so i need to interject how is that so are we lions here this is like a basic fundamental science in terms of controlling for variables Yeah, sure. Corey, we are. We are mammals. We are mammals. So the idea the, from the concept of evolutionary psychology is that there's status hierarchies in other animal mammals. Is that right? Just because we see mammals as less intelligent than us, and they are less intelligent. Uh, than I'm us, curious. Doesn't mean you, you can't find. Would you ever? So, would you ever take a drug that's only tested on felines? We say we share no. biological processes. Why? Why not? Okay, well, but, well, you, but, but you do take drugs that are tested on rodents. Uh, You've probably I, I, well, taken one this week that's, t- no, no, that's no. been tested on rodents. No, no. Well, that at some point in its history and development, but I will never take a drug unless it's a life or death situation that's only, that it's for, for only sure. been so, tested on. What can I, that's, what, that's so what's a, the that's rationale behind court, that? Corey, so here's the thing. If I'm making a building block towards an argument, 
and you're saying, well, your step one is not enough to completely prove your argument, that does not disprove my argument. What I'm saying is we can see status hierarchies from everything from lobsters to lions to chimpanzees. That means the fact that there happen to be status hierarchies also in Homo sapiens that have a 98.5% correlation genetically to chimpanzees, that could be that could be a piece of evidence that leads to maybe those same status hierarchies that they, uh, they have there, which allow them to more sexual access, would also do the same thing for Homo sapiens. Yeah, it's, it not a, it's not a catch-all. No, yeah, yeah, but it could be. But the same thing holds true of biological processes. In terms of we share biological processes we're, we're pretty much across uh, whatever, from humans to whatever, going You're back to You're making my even, point for me. Whatever. No, but, That's exactly but my that, point. No, no. If you let me finish, I will further elaborate on my point. This is why uh, when we develop a drug, okay, that we can't just rely on only testing uh, on, you know, felines, dogs, or even other primates. As in to actually show something efficacy in humans, uh, we have to actually test it in humans because there are certain intricacies and there's uniqueness about humans and their biological processes that are pretty much unique to them and that you cannot totally. uh, go back in history and just rely and on that alone. Just as you can't correct, rely on prairie voles we, for human sexuality. We do test it on humans. We do test these guys on humans and we do have status hierarchies in humans as well. Yes, so uh, you're I, right. So and what, I would agree. The, the, yeah. That there, there are some elements, but they are likely not as robust. Uh, as in, so you, uh, I wanted to respond to your whole robustness uh, of like in the field, because you brought up waist to hip ratio and sort of the examples you're giving, like they go back 3,000 years. Uh, that's mm -hmm. not necessarily an example of a so, field so, being are, robust are you, are, or rigorous. Uh, of like, right, but, but it, so, it is robust when there's 37 different cultures that are all tested by Dr. David Buss. The first time is in 89, they do another one with 50 different cultures. The Yanomama Indians don't have radio, television, or film, and they don't have billboards or magazine ads, and they were just as interested in casual sex as the men were in Japan and India, okay? The, what we found is that men across these different cultures, when the cultures had nothing to do with each other, they found that men preferred, were more interested in casual sex than women in all of these cultures. Women preferred men that were taller than men in all of these cultures. Women were more concerned with men's ability to procure resources in all these cultures. If you want to say there's 50 different, you're, you're right, I can't go get back 3,000 years and test these people. But if you want to say there's 50 different cultures, and all of them, they have nothing to do culturally. And I don't know, Corey, maybe this is the first time you've heard this, but you should look up Dr. Buss's 1989 no, I know study David of 37 Buss. cultures. I haven't read all his yeah. research because it's a lot, yeah. but I'm aware of yes. David Buss. But, but the, the rigor by which they put, the, and the replication by which they put to this, and when things go different, then hypothesis change. This happens all the time. Uh, it's not something that they're just stuck to. Again, the dual mating strategy was the concept that what would happen was a woman would like a man and then she would she would lock down that whatever, I'm just going to use a term placeholder here, beta man, and then she would cheat on that man with the bartender who, was, who had the really good genes. And she would do both at the same time. Well, Dr. Buss looked at the stat data and it was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. When women cheat in a relationship, they fall in love with their affair partner 83% of the time. When men cheat, it's 29% of the time. That makes no sense. So what he came up with is a mate switching hypothesis. He changed it because the, the new data came in. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is exceptional rigor when it comes to this field. That's not an example for one researcher is not an example uh, of rigor and and one one researcher replicating their own hypothesis is not also an okay. so, example. So, so of Corey, rigor. Corey, I got all day. We'll do the parental investment hypothesis. This is a concept mm -hmm. that also comes from evolutionary psychology, where in a two gender species, which gender uh, provides more in child care? That is the pickier of the two genders. In every single two gender species, this holds true, including seahorses where the men hold the children and same thing, there's a certain type of fish where the men just ate the children or something like that, the females compete. If parental investment hypothesis, which is a concept that comes from evolutionary psychology, it is falsifiable and has never been falsified. I've got 10 more if you want. There is tons of rigor when it comes to these things. This idea that it's just like, trust me, bro, is not true. Like, this is not what Leah Cosmides or Gadsad or David Buss or uh, Marty Hazelton or Stephen Stuart Williams or Hector Garcia or any of these other professors that all went to Harvard, Stephen Pinker, like a bunch of them went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Stanford. They didn't just do this and just come willy nilly and say, well, you know, the gender roles, therefore, fuck, uh, you know, fuck all women. That wasn't that's not what evolutionary psychology came up with. Right. Uh, what? Well, yes. What, so. Uh, let me just maybe I should clarify my position as I sort of uh, tried to uh, maybe poorly emphasize in my opening statement as in I recognize that there's value in the field. I don't think it's like an invalid field. I would just say, yeah. I guess, to distill, it's sort of like one dimensional as in you're trying to explain the entirety of all human sexuality like through this one particular lens. I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you. That, that part uh, is very ostentatious. I agree with you.
uh, where then I'd be curious. Uh, so if you want to expand upon, because I think I understood where you were going in terms of the altruism yeah. aspect. So like, uh, what, like what research would you rely upon uh, to sort of fill in that gap of like, well, altruism explains adoption. Uh, across the board in every aspect yeah. would you say that that is what plays out in every single aspect of adoption well, we, 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 well if we looked ancestrally we did see where when children's parents would die that other m other women in that yeah. culture in, in, in other village, tribal communities i agree with you and there would be certain advantages in terms of if you as the mother couldn't take care of your child it is advantages to allow your child for adoption i'm asking you today do you think that explains the entirety of what occurs adoption let's say in the developed world do you think that explains no, no. and angelina jolie's adoption of whatever <laughs> three children Right. So, so from her standpoint, is it altruism for those children? I mean, she chose to love those children, right? They didn't do anything for her. They didn't pay her any money. She chose out yeah. of her own heart to do so. Well, right? they did. So, they, they, but the concept well, wait, of altruism but, so, well, uh, reciprocity. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, show me the reciprocity. Right. So there is that, no that is the altruistic so, behavior. So, right. So, so if you want to look at the proximate reciprocity, there is none. The children can't do anything for you. The ultimate reciprocity is I've done better for the world by raising children. I have three cats in here right now. They're uh, rescued. I think that's an example. The world of this, is again, better. The post hoc rationalization. Like, yeah, yeah. How can but, but, I? How can but, but, I? Okay. Okay. Corey, how can Corey, I argue Corey, with Corey, that? So, I've made the so, world so, better. So we'll do, so we'll do that. So we'll do this. You finally found one where you can argue because I haven't presented the data for you, but there's tons of data talking about why there's altruism amongst Homo sapiens. Tons of people have done yeah. research on this, including Pinker and Bus. So, yeah, you're right. I don't have it in front of me. I apologize. But I, the, no, the idea that there is no data or it's like, trust me, bro, that's just not. Dude, no, no. Here's the thing. Go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say this. Um, when it comes to evolutionary psychology, I love behavioral psychology. I've learned so much more about it. I'm learning more about developmental psychology after watching home math. I'm mm -hmm. I love this whole idea. I'm not just of this idea that there's just one explanation for everything. But what I found is that whenever I talk to highly politically conservative people, which I'm not saying you guys are, they tend to not like evolutionary psychology because they're like, fuck evolution. They don't like that. And when I talk to highly progressive people or like feminists, they don't like evolutionary psychology because it shows innate sex differences between men and women. So they don't fucking like evolutionary psychology. And when I talk to postmodernists, they don't like the idea of an ultimate truth. So they don't like evolutionary psychology. So here we have this rigorous study that's just being pinned in from all sides politically. And then it takes fucking, what, 10 years for Dr. Bus to get on fucking Joe Rogan, even though Joe Rogan's symbol on his thing is a fucking monkey and people have been telling him for years to have him on the show he didn't even conceive of having an evolutionary psychologist on there until recently until jordan peterson told him to do it this this is the most underrated player in the league to in my opinion it's the Pablo i think Bancaro to, of the fucking i think NBA. i ahead, agree Justin. with you that there's definitely a lot of people that like write stuff off because they're just uncomfortable of where it goes that absolutely yeah. happens mm -hmm. uh i think iq and race and intelligence research mm. is a really good example of that mm. uh, however it seems like neither person on either side is willing to acknowledge the faults in their own camp and that are there people that run away from anything related to Evo psych or psychology in general because they feel like it's, you know, poised against women? Sure. But is it incredibly yeah. attractive to a certain subset of men because it's like poised against women in some ways? Absolutely. I, agree with like, I think there are a lot of people that are drawn to it just because they can establish some sort of hierarchy that they themselves haven't established in their real life, but they can at least find it in some scientific literature. And then they utilize that as a weapon, basically, mm -hmm. or a cudgel against women on fucking social media or whatever. So I think the issues happen on, on both sides. It's just so, this so, is why so I said it's scary that when you have these all explaining all encompassing yeah. narratives that explain so much because people get really sucked into them in a really negative way so i think i think the important thing destiny is to understand it's it's uh descriptive without normative like so for instance uh dr bus's first book was on murder and he goes over like you know some outrageous number of murders of committed men committing uh men killing other men over women or committing uh committing murder over territory all right mm -hmm. and killing men over over territory and when you go to that what what happens is people are like i can't believe you wrote this book this book is terrible. It's condoning jealousy and murder. Oh, yeah. And it's like, no, no, no. The oncologist does not condone cancer, but he studies cancer. And the historian may study Erwin Rommel, but he doesn't condone Erwin Rommel. Even though he's a great tank commander, he was a horrible fucking racist. You can still study the thing without knowing. And I, I'm making your point, Destiny. I, I totally agree with you. What happens is when you take a descriptive value and then you try to make it normative, then it's a problem. So for instance, the concept of like, Natural selection. Well, that's what uh, we'll just say those people who ran the, um, the Germany in the 1930s and 40s, they believed, well, the Jews are lower down on the totem pole. Therefore, natural selection, we're just going to get rid of them. That's an example of using uh, natural selection for a horrible reason. But that's what you're doing is you're taking something that's descriptive and you're making it normative. And so I agree with you. We shouldn't do that. And well, I, I would have less issues if it, uh, you know, 
remained more descriptive. Like, I understand. So that's why I think it has some utility in, in terms of explaining some behavior. Uh, but I think it's just, again, just like one dimensional where that's why I brought up the exceptions. It's like, yeah, yeah. if sure. you can explain to me those exceptions, like, uh, you know, I'd be curious to know of like, you know, uh, how, how you, how you would explain. I'm cur yeah, cur cur curious, Corey, as a, as a, as a biologist, you are aware of like reciprocity, like chimpanzees cleaning each other, stuff like that. Yeah, no, no, that, that's why I wanted you to, uh, that's why I brought up like, well, right, show that, me the reciprocity with the adoption where I agree with that. So that's where it's classically defined okay, typically so, so, of like altruism is a reciprocity. I'll do something for you. And with the sort of implicit yeah, expectation yeah. that at well, some, that we're down the road, it'll pay off. I'll take it even further. Evolutionary psychology does not have a clear explanation for homosexuality, but it doesn't like yeah, say, well, exactly. homosexuality is bad and it doesn't disprove uh, evolutionary psychology. What it says is there might be things in our, our combination of genetics that we just don't know. We just don't know why those things are. I've heard one incredible, uh, it was the Dr. Satoshi Kanazawa came up with two theories. One of them was the idea that there is a gene in men or a gene that manifests in women that makes them hypersexual towards men, but that same gene manifests in women that makes them hyper, or men that makes them hypersexual towards men. That's one theory that someone had. It doesn't mean it's true. There's another theory that has to do with um, uh, testosterone in utero and then testosterone at, uh, in, in uh, puberty. But again, these are just theories, but it doesn't, it's not one of these things where it's like, well, we can't explain homosexuality, therefore it's bad. No, it's just a thing we haven't figured out yet. Just like we don't know dark matter and dark energy. It doesn't negate astrophysics. No, right. so, it's, a, it's a perspective that, that, is, that they're using to take on that. I, Corey, I think earlier I heard you say that EvoPsych was like one dimensional and that people try to use it to explain everything. I wasn't really aware that that was even happening until you said it. Is that like a problem that you perceive as going on with EvoPsych that people universalize it? Uh, it, it could just be maybe the spheres that I run in, but that's sort of, uh, uh, you know, and it might just be a reflection of me. Uh, but sure. like, yeah, I, no, I, no, I Corey, sure. Corey, you're making a great point. I think a lot of people have taken this shit and bastardized it. Absolutely. That anybody who uses evolutionary psychology to hate women, you're just, you're, you're taking something descriptive sure. and you're making it normal. Yeah. Now we're talking about, we're talking about like, like, uh, uh, injunctions that create truth and then how the truth affects people. Like those are entirely different territories whether or not it's affecting people in certain ways is entirely distinct from the, the truth-making process itself, which I think bears quite a lot of merit in and of itself. I mean, I would, I would argue against that. Um, I think that while we can have separations of descriptiveness and prescriptiveness, the idea that description and prescription are entirely and completely in separate domains doesn't really make any sense when you consider that the things that we choose to aim ourselves at descriptively are usually done for prescriptive purposes, right? Nobody researches a random topic. Nobody investigates a random thing scientifically. Uh, I think that the description there is more instrumental in whatever prescriptive thing we're looking to further. So if somebody's, for instance, doing a descriptive investigation into a medicine that might help regulate your blood sugar, right? There's obviously normative value there. It's not like you're just saying, like, oh, well, I'm just researching the facts of how to maintain a person's blood sugar. You're also looking for the normatively good quality of trying to yeah. help people live happier and healthy lives. So I think there is like, I mean, obviously there is a difference between description and prescription, but I'd be careful, mm -hmm. like separating this out completely is a bit of a fool's error. And, and, and I'd say disingenuous at worst, uh, because like, for instance, like if I were to publish a study that shows that like 99% of people that play the video game Call of Duty grow up to be like child rapist murderers. And then I just yeah. throw that out there to pretend that that is merely a description with no prescriptive or normative weight behind it whatsoever it. is obviously foolish like people are going to take that and run in very predictable directions with it so you're so saying that the, the, the things go that ahead, people yes yeah, so, thanks you're saying the things that people say based on evo psych are intended to influence society in a particular way um, or at least it feels like in the at least in the red pill circles or in the dating circles, like obviously a lot of it is heavily normatively loaded. Very little sure. of it seems to just be like descriptive based. It seems like, especially in, in the modern red pill stuff, because it used to be for like pickup artist stuff and even red pill stuff. I would say like 2013, 2014, 2015, a lot of it felt a little bit more descriptive. Uh, although there was like the incel band and the women hating band and whatever the fuck, sure. uh, whatever going into that. But it felt more like a how do I use this to pick up women or how do I you know yeah. use this to date more chicks or bang more chicks or, or whatever. Justify whereas, how I feel already. Sure, yeah. Whereas today, especially when the red pill has started to encompass so many more ideas about globalism and Ukraine and Israel and vaccines <laughs> and blah blah blah, it feels yeah. like it's less of a description and more like part of this kind of like prescriptive worldview. That is a feeling. And I just want to sort of like tack on uh, sort of what you brought up earlier. What you're talking about in terms of like the uh, the one dimensional aspect, where mm -hmm. at least again, this just might be from what I observe or this, this uh, what I see on social media. But it's also, let's say, an interesting observation where it's like you know a certain demographic, uh, you know, they'll be heavily invested uh, in Evo Psych and the research, and you know whatever cherry pick, uh, whatever comes from out of there. But then when it comes to overall research at large, it, uh, the narrative tends to be like at least in these circles, like you can't trust it. Uh, like yeah. research about vaccines. I mean, I 
the overall scientific endeavor at large. But Evo Psych, like that's that's held up as like whatever the gold standard. Everything that comes out of there that confirms my bias, I got to go with that. I see. Okay, I understand where you're coming from a lot better now. So you're you're saying there's like a large segment of society that's using it to push a narrative. Well, at least from what again, I'm not really in. Uh, I'm not involved in these spaces. For what I observe of the spaces, uh, let's say incel spaces out as an observer, it's like yeah, I you totally know, agree they, with Corey. They undermine you know vaccine yeah. research. They don't understand it, uh, and they'll undermine every aspect well, of research that goes against them. Uh, but then yeah, Evo Psych. Although cherry pick the one the one piece of research that happens to again mm. confirm what they believe. I don't think Evo Psych. I don't think Evo Psych undermines vaccine research. But I do understand yeah. that the people who want to undermine vaccine research might be on that same side. Uh, I can see that. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up uh, about the normative and descriptive thing that you were saying before. So last chapter of The Evolution of Desire by Dr. Buss, he goes into a, a description where he's like, why is that we do this? Why is that we study these ideas? So his first book was about murder. And one of the things we have to understand is why do people commit murder? As a society, if we understand these things, there's fewer women around, fewer opportunity. We find that when men are older, they don't uh, commit murder. When you put a bunch of like angry men, uh, young men with a high testosterone in a room together and there's no women and there's no economic opportunity, you might get more, more violence. Since we understand these things, what can we do to stop these things? So as far as like what's the, the purpose behind it, that's his purpose behind it. My purpose behind it additionally is like to understand, hey, why did this guy get picked over me? Why is it that my girlfriend like was looking at this dude instead of me? Why is when I was in my 20s, it was like, why did I lose out to this dude? Like, what is it? Why is it that the guy who's like the really smart uh, oncologist, why is it that his wife cheats on him with a fucking bartender that makes like one eighth as much money? Yeah. What is going on here? I wanted to know the answers to that. So for me, that was the reason why I got into it. Yeah, that's exact. That's exactly the purpose of what I do too. Is I'm I I you know again haven't read as much Evo Psych as developmental psych, but the way that I use it is to figure out what is it that's going on in the deep deep subconscious that people don't know about. We don't know what's going on in our own subconscious. We don't know what's going on in the subconscious of other people, and if, if we can find anything that's going to describe you know more accurately what it is that. You can show in your body and in your language and in your in your posture, whatever it is that shows up in the world in perception that's going to make people perceive you in a certain way or that you're going to perceive in a certain way. That's a way of structuring our lives differently. That's what I, I find coming out of the of the field that's of such great use is you can eliminate you know negative behaviors in yourself, negative perceptions in yourself and respond to them coming from the world in the same way using these the insights that come from this field. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, oh, math, uh, like, <laughs> yeah, you're, I get you're, it. Um, so it's your hard to say it the first time, isn't it? Uh, yeah, Sorry, I'll work on it. Um, it's Dr. Ho Math. Soon it's going to be Dr. Ho Math. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> but, but yeah, your background is in developmental psych, about, and almost uh, almost certainly uh, guaranteed you are way more well versed in psychological research uh, than I am. But like, there is there's a wealth of psychological research outside of Evo Psych that is also like beneficial uh, in terms of whatever the benefits of whatever uh, optimism, et cetera, et cetera. The benefits uh, of whatever mindfulness meditation. Like, why why have you at least so I don't, I don't know. This is my first encounter with you. Why have you, yeah. it appears that you, you've, uh, you know, hinged your hat uh, on Evo Psych specifically. I'm sorry. What was the question? Why have I? Why have I? Yeah. Why have you essentially singled out this particular field? Because there are many well, fields uh, yeah. that, again, you can extract benefits from in the psychological research. I, I wouldn't say that I have. I don't think that that me being uh, pro Evo psych here tonight necessarily means that, like, I'm just drawing a boundary around it and saying, don't touch it. It's perfect. It's just that what I have found in the field of Evo psych has really helped me help people being able to explain to people this behavior is why she reacted that way or uh, uh, this is why you are no longer interested in this person. It's based on this physical thing. It's this observable physical thing that's happening that's giving you an emotion that's based on your body deciding whether or not it's going to survive. That has been a really powerful tool for me to actually help people in personal coaching sessions and in, in you know, making all my descriptions that uh, people seem to be enjoying quite a bit. I'm, I'm popping off a lot. It, it, it's, it's like whatever it is that people are getting from this, it's springing directly from that field. Like evolutionary psychology is informing what I do and it's, it's giving people uh, immediate yeah. power over their lives. As a clarification, this is sort of a joke, but, uh, is your channel name, uh, informed by Evo Psych? Home app? Is that, uh, yeah, my, my channel name, 
My channel name is the first video I made accidentally went viral, and someone said I didn't expect to wake up to home math, so I just kept it. That's how Daft Punk got their name too. Okay, but but is that hearkening to any sort of like agenda, or is that just like you know you whatever it's, a joke? It's sort it's half a joke, and it half means like the way that we pursue desire shapes our world. Okay, in interesting, but yeah, yeah. like uh, you know, at least for me, uh, upon first, first encountering that whatever channel name, like that invokes something at least, and that might just be my I, bias, yeah. but that seems to hark into, you know, a certain, no, a certain fair. viewpoint, a certain view. Sure, I make it hard to like me, but then I overcome it. So yeah, <laughs> but I think that um, brings, hey. speaks to the point of what you brought up earlier, uh, Michael, in terms of people sort of weaponizing evil psych to hate yeah. on women, <laughs> and uh, hey. to then see that channel name that's popping off. Cool. Corey, I'm, I'm curious. Have you read The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker? Uh, no, I'm not really a huge fan of Steven Pinker. Well, could you? Why? I'm, I'm not just curious. Uh, well, even though he went to the Harvard of Canada and I'm Canadian, McGill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of him as a scientist, uh, I'd say he sort of uh, lacks some rigor personally. That's just, again, okay. uh, that just might okay. be my bias. Sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah, but in the book, he does go over the concept of the blank slate. So the blank slate coming from like behavioral psychology, which is, but not, n n no real behavioral psychologist truly believes this anymore. But at the time, it was the concept of if I give a girl a Tonka truck, she will develop masculine qualities. And if I give a boy a Barbie doll, he will do, do develop feminine qualities. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, no, absolutely. I'm familiar with just oh, this like concept of blank slate or tabula rasa. Do you, do you, mm -hmm. do you believe in a blank slate as opposed to evolutionary psychology is what I'm, was what I'm asking? Uh, I guess more of a blank slate. Yeah, technically, as in like uh, you know, if we're if there was you know scientific evidence proving a tabula rasa, I would say that would be um, yeah, that would be that would heavily undermine Evo site. Yes, but do I actually yeah. believe that we are true yeah. tabula? Probably not, but that's just my intuition. So I, I got one more that I think is really interesting, um, and this is the concept of microbio or, or what's it called? Um, micro? What are they called? Microchimerism. Um, no, that's funny. Uh, no, it's uh, the idea of microbial food. Like, so for instance, there's another evolutionary psychology thing where they try to determine why is it that we have hotter, spicier food closer to the equator? So Thailand doesn't have a ton to do with Ecuador, but they have super spicy food. Why is that? And what they, what they find out is that when you're closer to the equator, you have more microbes that can get into the food. And therefore the spice is an adaptation that humans created over maybe thousands of years. I don't know how long spicy food has been spicy, but they've been doing that in order to protect themselves. But when you look at Norway and Sweden, they eat blander food. They don't eat food that's as spicy. And we seem to find this like across the entire globe. And there doesn't seem to be very many exceptions to that. In fact, I don't know of any exceptions to it. So this is a situation, the reason why I bring this up, because this is a situation where our biology then shaped our culture. Does that make sense? So, yeah, no, so you say, well, how does culture affect us? Dr. Buss said this, I didn't say this, but Dr. Buss said all psychology is in an evolutionary psychology. And so even though culture, so we say nature and nurture, how much of it is nature, so our biology, and then how much of it is nurture, even the nurture part comes from evolutionary psychology. It comes from our nature. That's the reason why, you know, we have, you know, we, we build parks in, in cities because we like to look at beautiful things. We like to look at nature. That society, culture has created a thing, but that thing was created because of our evolution. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, and well, I think... Oh, wait, hold on, wait. That's just a real quick thing. I don't know how much he says it directly, but that works equally the same with the environmental thing as well, right? That's what I was going to bring up, yeah. Like, well, yeah, it, it's, it's well, somebody, technically... Somebody had it started, though. No. Uh, well, the start would be environmental. The start is always environmental. Genes cannot exist without an environment to express themselves in. Sure. You can literally turn on or off any gene through any amount of environmental things. You can be predisposed yeah. genetically to be the tallest, smartest person in the world, and some level of malnutrition will make you a stunted growth retard. So I, like, not to say that there are no biological realities, but I'm saying we have to be very careful in trying to say that, like one reality is more real than the other reality. The reality is the distinction between nature and nurture is, is blurred at best. It's very, very hard to disentangle. Yeah, no, I agree. Because yeah. environment starts yeah, very early, literally in the womb. But. Well, so what, what I'm saying, so what you're, you're saying is the environment then causes the selection pressure that create the engine of natural selection. Yeah. And that does come from the environment. Of course, if we grew up on Mars, you know, inside of tubes or inside of like domes, we'd be probably taller because we'd experience less gravity. So yeah, for sure. The environment would change that as far as your biology. And it would probably also change, like maybe people with stronger hearts would live longer or something like that. I don't know. They would be able to pass on their genetics further. But I, I even though the the environment then does create the selection pressure. What happens is over a certain period of time, and in our case, like three billion years of like, you know, single cell organisms all the way up to Homo sapiens, um, what, what, what the result is, 
okay, these are the things that helped us survive, and these are the things we still like. 0.7 hip to waist ratio, facial symmetry, signs of youth, nice skin, those kind of things. Those are the things that we still appreciate in women, and we do so because the environment forced us, uh, having those desires allowed us to um, spread our genes more. Uh, and I think your example with whatever spice, uh, I think I can extrapolate that. I think a good example in my mind um, is food, where I can sort of provide an Evo psych lens in terms of explaining our food preferences. You know, we, mm -hmm. we tend to prefer, you know, savory, sweet, whatever foods. Mm -hmm. uh, but then to like extrapolate that in terms of like there, there are people that go out of their way to like, you know, eat healthy as in like, yeah. Uh, there are certain preferences as in if you ask me and poll me of like do I prefer sweet and savory foods? Yeah, I do. But is that what I choose for every single meal? Absolutely not. And I think that's that's more of a rarity. Uh, and that's why, like, again, I think that's that's one dimensional thinking where I'm sure there's some sort of evolutionary, uh, you know, psychological component to, let's say, rising obesity rates. Uh, but to say that explains all yeah. uh, or even explains, you know, people, let's say, eat, leading healthy lifestyle and, you know, valuing longevity. Uh, I think Evo Psych uh, has a hard time explaining that personally. Well, so so you would have different people on different, like, uh, like let's say, levels of thinking. Home Math and I talk about this sometimes. Mm -hmm. When you get on social media, it's a great way to be relevant, but it also brings you down to the lowest level of thinking. So let's go back to your example before. There's a great book by Jared Diamond, The World Until Yesterday. I forgot what it's called. He's a professor of anthropology at UCLA. I, I might be getting that wrong. But in his book, he goes over what happens whenever you take Inuit Indians or when you take aboriginals and you start introducing them to McDonald's, they become morbidly obese and then they become mm. diabetic. And it's because throughout our history, we had a we had a shortage of calories. But as soon as we are allowed to get to those calories, again, someone on minimum wage could eat enough French fries to kill themselves. Now, that was not uh, something that our ancestors, mm -hmm. you know, let, let, we'll say we have 70 years of that and 200,000 years of food scarcity. Right. And so our, we're more adapted to the food scarcity environment and so that's the reason why as soon as we had this food we were able to gorge ourselves but here's secondarily the idea of me counting my macros understanding the atkins diet the paleo diet all that kind of stuff that was technology that was not available to me in ancient greece and so maybe i didn't know i probably i understood if i eat fatty things i would get fatter but like i probably didn't understand those things for instance uh, think of the prescription against pork for for jewish people why what does that happen well, that probably comes from the, the idea that they didn't want people to catch trichinosis it probably wasn't even a religious thing it was probably a situation where it's like we don't want these people to catch trichinosis when they eat un, unclean pork then they can end up catching some kind of disease so we're going to prescribe you to not eat pork you see what i'm saying so mm -hmm. like, that's what that's that's the point i'm trying to make is like um I'm sorry. Evolution shapes, uh, you know, our proclivities. Yeah. So I would not dispute that. And that's where I think, you know, that would be the limits of like, again, I have my preferences. And I think this, this is also maybe a fault in the Evo Psych research large of like, you know, Evo Psych can tease out preferences, but when it comes to actual selection, uh, where I, I think the example is often brought up of like, whatever, preferring masculine faces, but not every single, mm. uh, woman necessarily selects that for like a long-term partner or like who they married just as like, yeah, mm. I prefer like eating ice cream every single day, but I don't actually do that if, as in, I pretty much like never do that. Uh, and that's where I think there's a little bit more nuance to be had, like in the conversation where I, I'd be curious to know. Well, couldn't, maybe couldn't self-control be an evolutionary adaptation? Uh, yeah, but then why isn't that every, why is not everyone able to exercise that? that amount this is a great question i believe this is just my my point I, I talked to dr bus about this and he kind of agrees is that there's because there's no selection pressure once you homo sapiens picked up the spear and became the apex predator on the planet the selection pressure against humans started to decrease and then once we got into modern medicine just consider a uh, great example is um uh, uh, uh stephen hawking stephen hawking had the ability to be one of the world's foremost physicists because of medical technology able to allow him to talk and speak and do you see what i'm saying so th those those added things are, are part of the reason why why we are the way we are does that make sense those added technological advancements so these people again didn't understand fifty thousand years ago hey i should probably shouldn't eat this food or i should eat this yeah they didn't but there are there are people that i obviously i don't know for sure but there are people that let's say they cognitively understand i'm like hey i should not be eating this thing or rather this thing is like detrimental uh to my overall health and yet i still actively engage like in this behavior and i think oh, it's whatever okay. i mean this yeah, piece I to, like I, egyptian at large but which is complicated but like yeah it's like yeah i i, I believe homo sapiens are maladaptive to have eight billion of us on one planet that's actually where i think it happens and what happens is because there's a lack of selection pressure then you have people who have you know, uh, the juvenile diabetes who would have died 300 years ago or people who would have died of dysentery several, uh, but think about the wealthiest man in the world, Henry VIII died of gout, something that's curable today. 
When you consider that, what happens is because there's such a lack of selection pressure, of course, you're going to get big people who have no self-discipline whatsoever. And the further away we get away from the survival scenario, what, it's not that humans always do the right thing. Humans do the easiest thing. In fact, most of life you're going to find is going to take the path of least resistance. And I think so, now well, the path of least resistance has changed because of culture. Well, so that's where uh, maybe uh, the discrepancy would lie. Like, I would agree with you that we're sort of maybe more inclined to, let's say, the, the perceived easy thing. But then how would you explain, let's say, you know, people who recreationally like run ultra marathons? Uh, mm. Don't <laughs> like how they get I mean, what they want. The easiest. Easiest. Uh, sorry to say that again in here. It's, that's how they get they want the easiest. That, that people who people who push like David Goggins, people who push themselves to the absolute, they want something in, a, in an extreme way. There's, there's very few David Gogginses. But I'm not even talking about David because like I can, I can even explain that of like there there's some status associated with him continuing to be whatever yeah. who he is. But but yeah. there are people even like whatever people in their 50s and 60s that like there's no at least as far as I could tell there's no status involved. It's like they just do it because they whatever at least they report that they enjoy it. They're not looking yeah, yeah. dopamine. Yeah, they're they're not they're not necessarily reporting everything that they actually get out of it. People sometimes report oh, I do it because of this, and they are not conscious of the reasons that they actually enjoy it. Right. And so I'd be curious how you like you would because that is a huge energy expenditure <laughs> like that. Yeah, is whatever. yeah. That's Somebody... hundreds of thousands of calories, if not more. So, yeah. So, someone uh, who's approaching elderly do, running marathons, what do they get out of it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, um, so. That, yeah, I have a I have a theory. So Daniel Lieberman wrote a book called The Story of the Human Body, and he goes over Homo sapiens developed as long distance hunters. I'm sure you're familiar with this idea, Corey. The idea, so humans, because we have sweat glands and other mammals don't have sweat glands like we do, we can go long distances and expel heat in a way that other ones can't. We have hair on top of our head to block it from the sun, but we also have kneecaps so that we can walk upright, and we have adductor and abductor muscles so that we can walk upright. We also have ligaments in the back of our neck that allow us to run and keep our head steady, and we have a ball and socket joint in our shoulder that allow us to throw objects overhand. And so what the theory was, and there was one guy, he walked from the Bering Strait all the way down to, uh, he walked from the Bering area in Alaska all the way down to Argentina to prove humans can walk outrageous distances. And so in doing so, maybe that's where the ultra marathon comes from. It's, it's, I hunted the gazelle for several days. Maybe this is something our ancestors did. They stabbed this gazelle and they, cause that's what we do. Most bovine, even though they can run faster than us, if you stab them, they, because they don't have sweat glands we, like we do, we mm -hmm. can eventually tr track them down. That's how humans were able to kill their prey over time. So that, that would be a possible explanation for the ultra marathon. Yeah, yeah. it could be, it could be something that that's based in like you know an ancient sort of need to do something but the the way that i look at it is that w anytime anybody repeats a behavior like that anytime that somebody especially when it's extreme like 60 year olds running marathons i once had a a, a 92 year old uh, teacher who ran marathons it's crazy and anytime somebody repeats a behavior like that it's i always view it as like mathematically perfect it's it's they're getting what they want to get which is why they do it. Explaining what it is can be really, really difficult because this is like a phenomenological reality. You have to ask them, what is it that you get out of it? And then what they report might not necessarily be the real reason because it's what they're getting exists in the subconscious. It could be that this 92 year old teacher of mine just thought that she was going to be sexy when she was done. And she might not know that that's why. Well, yeah. So like, I don't disagree. And uh, the, the, the explanation that you gave, uh, Michael, like I can see that as plausible. That's where mm -hmm. I think like, but that's where, uh, sort of, I wish he was like, was more transparent. Cause like, that's a plausible explanation, but like, then you need to provide the evidence of like, Hey, no, no, like, course, I can actually course. demonstrate totally. that. Um, so where, so Corey, you're, where you're making my issue lies. You're making, you're making a great point. So for instance, it's still called the theory of gravity because we've never actually witnessed a graviton. I don't know if you guys know that. We've never witnessed a gra We don't know. I know the flat earthers are just fucking <laughs> masturbating right now. They're so excited that I said that. But, but we, be, it's still called the theory of gravity. But we know we, we measure over time, 9.81 meters per second squared is what is the distance at which things fall. At some point, we have to build the Burj Khalifa. At some point, we have to send a shuttle into space. And in doing so, even though it's a theory, we need some actionable, testable data to go out into the world and then build a building. But in this case, with evolutionary psychology, to meet a girl, to figure out, to not get cheated on, to yeah. try to develop ways of getting higher status. At some point, we have to, while this development, while this, you know, uh, from say 1970 to 19, no, to right now, this is 54 years of evolutionary psychology study is going on. At some point, I want to get laid. And so we, we, we got to take some of this information and run with it. Now, that's not the evolutionary psychology part. That's the normal guy trying to relate Evo psych back to his own life, which is what Alex was asking about before. 
Well, so let's let Destiny get a word in. I feel like yeah, we have please. like 30 minutes. Bro, I don't even. I, I'm not. What do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> and hey, dude, what was it like? What, was, what, what, the topic what, what does what does Alex Jones smell like, bro? That's what I, want I guess. Like I, or, oh, I, the thing that I don't understand, I guess, if we're trying to like draw this or relate this back to gravity. I just I don't understand like the need for Evo psych doesn't. I don't. I don't even know why would the average person would need any engagement or any informing from Evo psychology literally at all. You'd go by like polling data or discrete studies or whatever else. Because like if we wanted to make the gravity comparison, right? Like we do things right now. We shoot missiles at other countries. We send mm -hmm. rocket ships into outer space. Uh, we've got you know particle accelerators on planet Earth. We do all of this without having truly any fundamental understanding of what gravity is or where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but we still do it. You don't need like a full understanding of quantum mechanics to send. You know, a, a bullet through a gun to shoot somebody, or to throw a ball correctly, and yeah. to you know, yeah. So I, I guess I just I don't understand what the point so, is for like so, an average person. Yeah. So the point, you're right. The average person is never going to be exposed to evolutionary psychology. I totally agree with you with that. But they like, even way. though we don't understand dark matter and dark energy, and there's still still mysteries about quantum mechanics, and we haven't seen the graviton, we still continue to study, and that's why I think it's important. I think there's got, and the other thing is like. If, if somebody comes up with an idea, like for instance, you guys know there's two main things that I disagree with in the red pill space. Number one, I've always said men and women can be friends and should be friends. The best way to meet women is having other women introduce you. So I disagree yeah. with that idea, right? And then the other one was, I, I actually, this is gonna shock a lot of people, I think sexual assault is vastly underreported. I live here in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. I see it happen all the time. I disagree with red pill people when it comes to these concepts. But like, you gotta be open to other people's ideas and not be like stuck in one, um, I forgot what I was going, I forgot what we were just talking about. Oh, the gravity uh, situation. In, in this in this situation, it's one of these deals where it's like, even though I know I don't need full understanding, if I get so far off base, I need to know that I'm off base and someone is doing some kind of study showing, hey, is it likely that my wife, if she sleeps with another, you know, if, if, is it wife, like we, if my girlfriend cheats on me, is it likely she's going to leave me? Like, that's the kind of thing that Dr. Right. Buss studies in when men behave badly. And so that's the thing. Why, that's why I think it's important. But you're right. Yeah, but I feel like I feel like in that case, yeah. though, like if you were asking questions like that, evolutionary psychology would probably be the last place on Earth that you would actually look. You'd probably dip into really? any of the other relational psychology Wait. like people that you would be reading, like stuff from Dr. Gottman more than you would ever from like Professor I mean, Buss I mean, or whatever. Literally, literally, Mac and Murphy is an evolutionary psychologist and all he does is study cheating. Like that's the main thing he studies and does yeah. like I, the, the reason. Sure, why but has he do we do we have like a single good prediction that he's made or a single good like Yes, formula yes. that he so, can retrofit yeah so, like what's so an example of, of them, that it, it has to do like with attractiveness quotient so when somebody's attractiveness is like they're disproportionate you find that there's more cheating when it comes to that also you'll find when there's a large age gap like by the way this is something i'm open to my girlfriend's more than 20 years younger than me there's 178 percent higher rate of divorce between couples that are like the, the where there's a difference of 20 years so i'm yeah I'm, but i mean like wait did we really need like a whole scientific discipline to tell us that huge mismatches and certain characteristics but, will probably lead to people cheating? sometimes but how but how much but how much of a mismatch? Like, is it one standard deviation or is it like, for instance, there's a big difference. If the, if you said 55% of divorces are initiated by women, that's pretty significant. If we say more divorces are initiated by women, that could be 51% or 80%. It turns out it's about 69 to 75%. Well, that's outside of one standard deviation, 68.27%. Yeah, so like, that's true. But I, even at that, like the actual understanding then of what's going on, it isn't assisted by the stats at all, right? So uh, when we say, for instance, that like 80% of stats. women, yeah, we can, but like- the, There's context to it. The problem sometimes is that having stats Agreed. can lead you to be less informed or more misinformed than having no stats. So for instance, you might be completely ambiguous for who divorces who more or why people get divorced or whatever, but then you hear a number like, oh, well, 80% of women initiate divorces and you're like, oh, well, shit. Well, maybe women are the ones that are ending the relationships. But let's say that you were to find out that in like 95% of relationships where women initiate divorce, there was like cheating. I know that's not the actual story, but if you were to find it out, well, it kind of flips the other number. Or if you find out that women initiate divorce because they're more likely to need access to social services and being married actually hurts the woman more than it hurts the man, which is more true, mm. um, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, well, now you kind of reevaluate those numbers in a different light. I just I feel like having like these stats, also, these stats aren't Evo psych stats, right? Like women yeah, initiating divorce is yeah. some percentage thing, it has nothing to do with evolutionary psychology. So yeah, right. just it feels like finding these underlying explanations sometimes can be even more damaging. I would I would view it the exact same way from honestly, from an economist point of view. That for economists, like you've got things like behavioral econ and stuff now where they try to study individual behaviors. If somebody were to come at me trying to say, like, oh, well, I can predict the entirety of your company's trajectory using the labor theory of value or using some classical economist, you know, formula, right. I'd be like, well, fuck you. I don't care about any of this like crazy, yeah. you know, like this macro level econ theory. I just want to know like the actual particular metrics that affect my business. And if anything, get, getting it obsessed with that very, very macro level theory could actually hurt your ability to operate I, your business. I, I, I agree. And, it could hurt, but like, go ahead. Before you respond, I just want to build off that. Just to add one more thing in terms of the divorce stats of like, yeah, the women, uh, the stat of like women initiate divorce. So just to sort of add more context and what seems to get left out 
uh, in the discourse about that, at least in whatever red pill spaces, uh, is like one. Of, if you look into, let's say, uh, the the couples therapy research, the most common pattern is like the women wants to work on the relationship. They'll go to like a couples therapist, uh, and they pretty much like the man is not willing to go, uh, and it's like part of the the challenge is like getting the man uh, convinced to like go to couples therapy because very mm. often they have concerns about oh therapist is going to be against me or for whatever reason where the, the woman is typically willing to work on the relationship the man is not uh and then it's only after pretty much the, the woman gets fed up that they initiate divorce uh where we uh pretty much generally speaking just across the board men are not willing to either go to individual therapy or couples therapy the the the, the, the percentage of married couples that go to couples therapy at all though is a minority and and of that i don't know that we could say that because because like if my girlfriend wanted me to go to couples therapy i would just go it's like yeah it's whatever i i i I understand that some men would do it. I just don't know that it explains, you know, 69, 70%. Maybe. Well, I mean, so, probably. Uh, so I would just use that as an example of like typically, uh, usually it's like, uh, I use that as an example of like a clear example of the woman wants to work on the relationship. But there are sure. uh, there are instances of like outside of couples therapy, uh, like the woman wants to take some sort of action to repair the relationship. Uh, and typically cool. it's met with cool. inaction on, on the man. Corey, I, I, think, I think women divorce men more than the other way around because of the parental mm -hmm. investment hypothesis. Women bear more burden. Women are pick, the pickier gender. Therefore, they even we even see it with lesbian and gay couples. Lesbian couples get divorced at twice the rate that men that gay couples do. So even when there's they don't have men to blame, they get divorced more because they're pickier. But that's the reason why we have skyscrapers and a space program because women were picky. It's men well, but even on that, like this, I feel like this is an example of walking into the bought in too much to a hypothesis trap. Pretty sure the reason why women get divorced more, I think, is largely explained by the fact that they need to to acquire social services. That if a man and a woman break up and they, there is children involved, the woman has the children. She can't sure. qualify for anything until she actually files for a divorce. The guy can stay married forever mm -hmm. and just go fuck off to another state. It doesn't really affect him one way or another. But until the woman actually files the paper for the divorce, she can't qualify for any form of welfare. She can't qualify for any form of like single parent help. WIC, any, all of that is completely out the door. I think that was l the large explainer um although it's hard to get actual facts on this because even that percentage of women that initiate divorces i think it literally just comes from one number from like 40 years ago i don't even know how well established mm -hmm. that number is but um yeah the parental investment hypothesis again why like how would that explain even the um if lesbians are divorcing at higher rates and there are no children involved well so so the the number one predictor of whether or not lesbians get divorced is when there are children involved that's when the divorce gets initiated so mm -hmm. i it's it's tough to say but I, what i'm saying is regardless let's say a woman who doesn't have children destiny she's still pickier than a man a man like uh, the average man is going to have sex with whatever attractive woman he finds attractive will allow him a woman is going to be more selected even if she doesn't have children so the, the parental investment hypothesis just states that of the two genders one of them is more picky because in general that gender uh, carries more of the parental load like when a girl's 16 she's not thinking you know i'm not gonna if i have sex then i'm gonna have a baby and i'm gonna be stuck with this and there's more responsibility for she's just having feelings but women in general because they don't have men have 17 times as much testosterone as women do they're just not as interested if in I, casual sex as men if i more, had that more selective yeah if i was operating with that hypothesis then wouldn't wouldn't it usually be men that would initiate divorce hire isn't that what i would expect if that was the hypothesis i was operating under because wouldn't i expect what, if women which are more part would cause the men because well, because the men just want to fuck anything, they would just divorce their wife ASAP and go find somebody else to fuck. But if the right, women are divorcing, they can do that. They can do that while married. So can yeah, a woman. Yeah, so home said it. Yeah, they can do um, that while so, married. They, they yeah, but so can a woman. Out. A woman can do it while married too, right? Uh, sure. But Destiny, yeah. I think uh, uh, the, the, every, all the data we've seen that shows that when women cheat, though, they tend to fall in love with their affair partner and don't want to keep the previous yeah. affair partner right. more so than a man who can have a wife and a mistress. That men tend to be able to have, you know, I got my baby mama and my side bitch kissing they like, like down, yeah. a future sets. They seem to be more comfortable with that than women do. I'm not saying there are. There's certainly sure, that's fine. But now it seems like we've switched to a different hypothesis than to explain the behavior because before it was parental investment. And now it feels like it's something now it has to do with emotional investment and partner. No, 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 no. It, it, let's go back uh, in the 37 culture study. Men are more interested in casual sex than women. But it doesn't uh -huh. mean that men are more interested in leaving their wife than women because they want a variety of sexual partners. Well, let me gotcha. let's try it like right. this. I am I am right. an individual yeah. phenotype living 50,000 years ago. I'm an individual man. Is it it's be, it's beneficial for me to spread my seed by having one partner where I take care of these children and then have multiple other partners where I have quick yeah, liaisons. Maybe we raided another uh, tribe and we killed all the military age males and we ended up having sex with the women. The possibility of my genetics getting passed on is actually increased because I've chosen one main partner and then several different other partners. So that's an adaptation that men have might have had in the past uh, in, in order to get by, which is why men probably have a, a, an easier time having sexual attraction for multiple women 
than women do with men. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, there's tons of women, you and I both know them, that have sexual attraction for multiple men at the same time. But I just don't think that's the norm. Or it's not as normal as it is for men. Well, so to uh, bring it back to, I think, what Destiny brought up early, because like it seems like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like well, it's like, uh, and also, whatever, whole math, uh, like it seems like you're <laughs> principle is like whatever to either attract a mate uh, assuming well let's say attract a mate and keep a mate uh, or attract a partner keep a partner yeah uh but then if it's the keep a partner aspect okay well like why is there not why is there pretty much at least as far as, as, far as i can tell no focus on what destiny brought up of like yeah john gottman's re research and like relationship quality uh and like john gottman can like predict well, divorce rates uh, and how relationship dynamics play out and what might lead to divorce as opposed to just like yeah just are this heavily focused on evo site uh, yeah, why not like look at the prolific pretty much relationship marriage researcher as far as i can tell i don't know what you mean by that why is there no focus on that because i'm like i'm a big proponent of john gottman i don't know what what you mean by in like are you saying that in evo psych circles they just kind of discard that uh well, uh well so i guess maybe i shouldn't say because i'm only going by pretty much what uh let's say uh individuals that um our proponents of Evo Psych, like Michael Sartain, is, and I've never heard, but I don't know your content, but I've never heard John sure. Gottman's research brought up uh, in any sort of Evo I mean, Psych I've, conversation that takes place in know, these types of spaces. I, I wouldn't call myself based on Evo Psych or anything, but I've I brought John Gottman up at least in two videos. He's a, I studied him in college. I think he's like the par excellence, you know. Really, out of how many videos, there. if I may ask? Uh, three, four hundred. This guy's less a, than this guy's one a machine over here. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm busy at work every day. But um, I think John Gottman is like the number one example of the because he's he's a really, really focused example of what I do. What, what I do is I focus on phenomenology. I fo focus on what it feels like to be in a particular situation rather than, you know, what we're talking about a lot today is um, the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. What can you measure and what does it feel and how do you trust somebody to tell you how they feel? I think that John Gottman's research is it's the best research I've ever seen on on trying to operationalize what it is that people feel. What is it that you're going through in a relationship and how do we how do you write that down in blocks and and chunks that that can be easily read and oh if you do this you're going to get divorced, right? That's the way that I perceive that kind of stuff. I don't see that as being in conflict with Evo Psych at all. I I feel that I feel that they go quite together quite synergistically and I'm not sure if you disagree with that or uh, no. Well, so uh, from what I understand, uh, and I'll even bring in other psychological research of like, you know, I would say John Gottman at its sort of like foundation is like whatever grounded in like whatever attachment or attachment systems or attachment theory. Uh, and I don't ever see that really mentioned in any sort of the Evo psych, uh, either well, uh, in the conversations about it or even in the research that, that I read about, but admittedly, not a lot. Yeah. So, so Corey, like, I don't go, like, I don't listen to, you know, Richard Dawkins on astrophysics and I don't listen to, you know, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson when it comes to, well, actually that's not sure he does talk about biology, but, um, mm -hmm. for the most part, like I understand that why they're going to talk about their specialty and because they don't cover everything, that doesn't mean they're discounting it. It's just not like, something that they don't cover. I'm actually going to buy this John Gottman book right now uh, after listening to the two of you talk about it. I want to try to be as open-minded as possible, but yeah, I, I think just because also, the algorithm kind of plays with you, dude. The algorithm, and this is something that I've noticed, is that the algorithm kind of sends me what it thinks that I want. And then I look at my girlfriend's, uh, you know, her IG and her YouTube, and it's totally different from mine. So maybe that's, you know, maybe it's the algorithm sort of feeding us that. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's fair. Like, I understand their algorithms definitely affect how we consume social media, myself included. Awesome. I'll reach consensus. Wow. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have anything to add before I kind of shift gears a little bit? Uh, let's do it. All right. So first of all, I just want to quickly comment on what you said, Michael, because I agree with you. Sexual assault being unreported. About half the girls I encountered has experienced it in some level or another, whether that's rape or that's just like, you know, got trying to rape or blah, blah. Dozens mm -hmm. and dozens and dozens. Not a single one that I've ever talked to has reported it. Not a single one. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I know it's kind of anecdotal, but I do agree with you. It's highly, highly underreported. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, and, and, but by the way, here's the reason why it's underreported. It's because of the situations with like the Lindsay Hill or the the Amber Heard, where they're just making up stories about people. I think that's part of the, the, the Lindsay Hill thing, where it was provably wrong. Because I think maybe uh, I was talking to my therapist about this, and she was like warning me. She was like, "When you deal with someone who has, say, borderline personality disorder, those are the type of people that will take the nuclear option of accusing you of something that you didn't do." But that four, three, four, five percent of women, that that to me. 
there's a massive number of women that are afraid because these women have cried wolf. And I think that's the, the ultimate issue here. No one should be more mad about Lindsay Hill or Amber Heard than women. It shouldn't be me that's upset about it. It should be women because I want women to be able to get the help that they need and they can't because these other women are crying wolf. And it's, but again, it's a small percentage of women that are doing this. Yeah. I mean, there's also problems with the justice system. Like a lot of the rape tests yeah. just don't, don't get tested. Bro, I, it, it's like one out of seven sexual assaults. They, I've heard some numbers that, that mm. get, uh, and by the way, do you want to know why this is a big thing for me? First off, because I work with domestic abuse charities, but the other, the other reason, human trafficking, but the other reason why is because this, why, why does this happen? It's because men either lack empathy or they suck with women. They suck with women. That's why would you ever sexually assault someone if you weren't good with women? That's the part that's crazy to me. And that's the thing that I think it can easily be improved. Now, again, some guys are sociopaths. You can't fix that. But there's I, a I few think guys. I think personally, I think a big part of it is just uh, like just people being kind of a little sick in the head. They just it's, sure. it's being uh, cruel, right? You enjoy the power dynamic of it more than you actually enjoy the sex. But yeah, generally, I think it would be interesting to see a study of like if they look at like all the rapists and like find out how good they are with women and see like is there a correlation <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. being a rapist and being oh. bad with women. That would be a very fascinating study. But anyway, so here's what I wanted to redirect to. Destiny, you did a lot of research about studies that disprove red pill dogma and talking points. Can you lay out some of the big ones to open up discussion to that? A big one I remember is you brought up a study showing there's only a mild difference in terms of body count between tall guys and below average height guys or fat guys and skinny guys. I personally found that very interesting because it seems extremely counterintuitive. But as far as I know, that study seems pretty legit. So, uh, yeah, can you kind of uh, lay some of those out, the ones that you found to be the most egregious uh, displays of how the red pill is wrong? Um, I, I just think everything revolving around like hypergamy, um, and like the, how hyper ultra exaggerated all those claims get end up not being borne out in any like strong study that I could find. Um, so for instance, yeah, like the difference in guys, height, income, all of these things don't seem to make much difference in average body count. It seems like the biggest differentiating factor is just if you want to fuck and you go out and you talk to a lot of girls trying to fuck, you probably will. Um, but like obesity, height. I think it was income, like these things just don't have as much of an effect if you measure them on average. I also think that people think that people's body counts are way, 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 way higher than they actually are. Yeah, that's I think true. on most of the Red Pill podcasts I've been on, um, like the consensus seems to settle around. I think when I was on whatever, they said that the average body count of a woman in college working in her undergrad was 50. Um, and it's just like an insane amount of uh, exaggeration on that or, or the, the, what was the 30, 40, 50% of college women are getting flown out to Dubai or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, think, yeah, that's yeah, I think people dramatically overestimate yeah. the sexual yeah, habits sometimes of people that play into whatever particular narrative that they're talking about. Um, so Destiny, you brought that up in the first time we debate, the first time we met, uh, when we were on Fresh and Fit. And the thing about it is I, re I remember it was something like six feet tall. They had like 10 bodies and six, one, it was like 12. And then I can't remember what it was, but it was like two or three bodies and what i from coming from the statistics standpoint what i heard was not 10 and 12 but what i heard was a 20 percent increase that's what i heard mm -hmm. the other thing is because like you said what is the median number of sexual partners for a man is five but the average is 15. i can't remember if i got those two numbers backwards or, or whatever it was but like the numbers in general for most men are just very low so because the number is low the variance is going to be low and that's why i thought the, those numbers were low uh, but here's well the, here's also the, the numbers thing. when we say the numbers for men are going to be low the numbers for men and women are always going to be the same they're going to it's going to be a no, one-to-one no, no, sure. equal yeah Oh, uh, in general, like what you were saying, in general, the numbers mm -hmm. are low. They're really not low, right? If I'm a, if I'm a Quaker 100 years ago, having five bodies is not low. Sure. But the like, biggest discrepancy who... was like, so for height, like very short on average, these guys had 9.4 partners for extremely yeah. tall. Theirs was 12.3. Uh, for mm -hmm. BMI, the underweight guys had 8.2. For people that were overweight, they hit, hit the highest. It was 12. My guess is a lot of muscular chad people are probably in that BMI category. But like these are the biggest differences. Yeah. So, so when I, when I hear nine and 12, I just hear a 33% increase. Like that's it. So like in general, if you extrapolate now that 33% increase, if you live in Brickle, now that average number is higher, whether it's if you live that in- That can be fine. And there are times when a per capita estimate is, is relevant or, or like a percentage increase is relevant, but there are other times where it's inappropriate and it's more absolute values are probably what we're looking at. For instance, if I were to go into a room with my family and I'd be like, oh my God, like you should meet like my, you know, my in-laws, they're insane. This guy has twice as many kids as we do and yeah. if i have one kid 
and he has two. Yeah. That's a really weird statement to make. You'd say, well, hold on, he's got two, you've got one. He's like, but that's a 100% increase. And I was like, <laughs> I guess, but good, yeah. the way that we deal with these numbers, if somebody were to say, yeah. you know, Chad dudes fuck 30% women more on average, you know, than, than short dudes, and the numbers are like 13 to 10. I just think most, so, most people wouldn't engage with that on a, on a per capita percentage basis. So, They'd probably be more interested in the absolute comparison. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think one of the things, because I, I loved when we had this debate before, one of the issues is like, when it comes to status, it's not just height or it's not just these, remember we had this discussion before, I agree with you that if a guy goes out a lot and tries to get laid a lot, he's going to get laid more. But remember that we had a discussion about more attractive women, how status would have to play a part in it. I do think status has to play some part when it, when it comes to that. And there's many different ways to have status besides just money and height. But money and height are demographic things that are very easy to calculate. So that's why we use those. But what we do find is that taller men do have sex with more, more than shorter men do. That we still did find that to be the case. So there is some sprinkle of hypergamy in there somewhere. But I'm, I'm of the camp that it's like you can overcome any of these things. Dude, Destiny, you have game. You, I'm mean, take this as sure. a compliment. Yeah, I understand. You punch way yeah. above your weight. And but I'm also, we, I'm also saying. Example of what I'm saying. Sure, but I'm saying like even, even the phrasing there is so loaded. Like you can overcome being short and, and yeah. fuck the same as a very tall guy. And the overcoming is short guys, so five five to five seven, have 11 mm -hmm. average partners. And if they overcome, maybe they can have as much sex as the tall guys who are five eleven to six one, who have 12 average partners. So if you overcome, you can have that one extra partner. And it's like, well, what are we even overcoming here? Like this seems such, like, right. such a weird thing to fixate on. Like it seems like almost yeah, a non-issue. Well, well, but that but that's, that goes back to my point. I think height is one of a myriad of attributes that women find attractive. And so the, the, the reason why the numbers are so close is because it's an average of uh, social networking, uh, c comedy, or like humor, uh, the ability to be charismatic, pre-selection, you know, a social proof, exact things like that. All of them go together and then they average out. And then so you're going to find like, again, I was talking to Bilzerian. By the way, I'm, I'm missing just, just how much I love you guys. I'm missing <laughs> a paintball at Bilzerian's house right now. I was going to go play paintball at Bilzerian's house and I skipped it just so I could come to this. But like I was talking to Bilzerian about this and he was talking about guys who are super wealthy and good looking and just don't get laid at all because they just don't know how to do it. So what does that mean? That means that there's things other than looks and height that allow men to have more success, successful women. But Destiny, you would, you would agree though, status plays a big part when we're dealing with like the most attractive women. Um, maybe, but well, like the thing is we would have to start like breaking down. First of all, what do you mean by status? And then what do you mean by most attractive women? Because I have a lot of status in my particular yes. part of the world. I don't know if I could fuck a single girl in Miami beach with my status. Cause it's totally not relevant to anybody out here. But if I go to other areas, like if I go to like fucking San Francisco or LA or certain parts, then my status might carry a lot of um, weight. And then when we say like most attractive women, do we mean like the, like Miami, you know, super plastic surgery women, or do yeah. we mean like women that are from Eastern Europe that are super hot? Or do we mean like Latina chicks with like big booties? Like, I think. It's weird because in some ways, like there's this weird red pill thing where it's like the most attractive women are after high status men, but it's actually attractive women with high status that are usually paired off with high status men. Like it's not okay. guys that are super wealthy. I don't know if you'll find me on this, but every other red pill does. Like guys that are super wealthy don't typically pair off with Starbucks workers, even if they're really hot. Usually it's right. other women from wealthy families or a place with a lot of status as well. Okay, so so I guess what I'm asking, like let's just say, I mean, we'll, we'll just take one, like say, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. Um, the most attractive women, I don't know what you like, but let's just say Eastern European women, whatever. It, it, amongst that, do you think you have a better chance with more attractive women, the higher status you have? And when you, the second question was, what does status mean? Let's include all yeah. things that we could find as attraction triggers. And if you want to look at what those attraction triggers are, you can read uh, The Evolution uh -huh. of Desire, where it, all those different things. Yeah, if I mean, I'm gonna, have I'm gonna, I have to agree with you, but you've yeah. like tautologically defined it as such. You're asking me, basically, do you have a higher chance with somebody who, if you possess the characteristic that gives you a higher chance with them. That's what we're asking, right? Yes. And the, the really well, interesting, yeah. The, the interesting no, but, question but, is what do we mean by status? That's the interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Well, it's culturally this, actually, relevant. This goes, this goes all the way back to evolutionary psychology. The, you're saying, do you have a higher chance of getting with a woman if you have more things that that woman wants? And the answer is yes, but why does a woman want those things? And the answer goes back to evolutionary psychology. We would find men with more, like w women do not want Arnold Schwarzenegger, but they want men who are more muscular than average. That would have aided in survival. So things like that, w that's the reason why we have those proclivities. Sorry, man, I'm, I'm off on a tangent, but that goes back to evolutionary psychology stuff. Go ahead, Home Math, yeah. you were saying something? Yeah, status is like, it's like localized. Wh whoever it is that you're trying to uh, seduce, is going to have an idea of what's going to bring her closer to all the people around her and make her more beloved. Like that's what status really is. It's not a universal thing among humanity. It's what do I think is going to elevate me? There's there's a certain set of characteristics that differs from place to place. Like you said, in Miami and San Francisco, it's going to be really different. Mm. But it's the same principle. 
Uh, and I just want to add on sort of, uh, so I'm going to post in the StreamYard uh, chat. So it, it's just one study. Uh, and it hasn't been replicated, uh, but just so as a caveat, uh, but I would say this type of research uh, sort of, uh, I would say runs against sort of uh, the Evo psych uh, research where this is a study across 10 nations uh, and it's sort of, it's correlated or rather they see as no association as, as pretty much uh, there's more gender equality uh, in these nations, uh, the, the preferences for mates uh, also changes and they, there's a preference for more egalitarian uh, relationships. If you want the full study, you message me in Discord and I'll send you the full study. But I'll also say it's one study, yeah. hasn't been replicated, but there yeah. is uh, some research I, that counters the narrative. I don't have this study in front of me, but I, I have heard of one where women in Norway and Sweden, where they were, were the, the areas were more egalitarian, those women wanted a more masculine man to take charge. I, then maybe I'm re re being very reductive in it or I'm simplifying it, but that's a study that I also heard. So I don't know. Well, so that's I mean, where, sure was, that's where it gets into like uh, sort of because the, the narrative that I hear is like whatever uh, women securing resources uh, and like so it doesn't uh, it's not necessarily a, a one to one of like, yeah, just because they prefer masculinity uh, that therefore like uh, it's correlated with like resources as in it's almost like a, a misfiring where it's like, uh, yeah, more masculine men don't necessarily always have more resources. It's, it's all the different attributes. So for men, we kind of have a number. Uh, Dr. Buss and Cindy Messon wrote a book called Why Women Have Sex. And they said if we wrote a book called Why Men Have Sex, it would be a pamphlet. It's like men have sex for a very small number of reasons compared to the reasons why women have sex. They, uh, they, they identify 237 reasons why women choose to have sex with men, whereas like there's like four or five for men. And so because of that, that deviation, there's several different things, not just money. I, I had this discussion with Jamie Lynn. She's a therapist here in, in uh, Las Vegas. And she was like, you know, there's women out there who date men who make less than them that are male strippers, blah, blah, blah. And so hypergamy isn't real. And it was like, no, no, you think hypergamy is just money. Other people think hypergamy is just hype. Other people hypergamy is just Instagram followers. And the answer is it's a it's an amalgamation of all of it. Well, so that's where it's almost like uh, I can't argue against that because it's pretty much everything's going to boil down to status uh, at, at some level where pretty much like every preference uh, is just going to seem to boil down to status. At least that's what I'm here. I could just be misunderstanding you. Well, well could, uh, could, it, could it be like, this, like, Corey? Could it be this, Corey, that the reason why we identify those things as status is because the opposite sex finds it attractive? Like one of the things, one of the things I love this from evolutionary psychology is the concept that Homo sapiens are the only species where the men and women choose the arena upon which the opposite gender uh, com combats. So men compete with other men for access to women based on the stat, based on the things, the status markers that women find attractive, and me and women compete with other women based on the things. That's why you see some women in Miami getting bigger butts, right? Or wait, why like is that? that? That's something I don't. All, don't most species do that? Don't no, uh, so, 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 so no, because in, in some species, like for instance, with the peahens and the, and the peacocks, it's just one side choosing the other side's arena, but it's not both sides. Does that make sense? Oh, both sides. Okay. So, so, so look, mm -hmm. look, what I mean by that is, is a, an elephant bull seal must kill another elephant bull seal. So the arena is derived by the women, but it's not the other way around. Like the women don't compete with each other for the elephant bull seal because he's has sex with all of them. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm getting way off. I apologize. I, like, home no, 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 you guys talk more. I apologize. Uh, but, but so then I'm curious, like, so maybe just to like, uh, yeah, distill it down and, and like ground your, uh, make explicitly clear, as in, do you think when it comes to whatever dynamics uh, in terms of like mate selection, it all boils down to like status as in every single like mate selection no. just at its core. Okay. No, because, because I agree with what Destiny says too. You, if a guy has the desire to go out there, like oh, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, this is, by the way, this is not scientific. This is just my saying. It is more alpha to be there than to not be there. And one of the examples I give, it's just one anecdotal example, or it's just one example, is the number of men when they got back from World War II after being gone for 15 months, two years, four years in some cases, the number of them that had to file for divorce was outrageously high because they just weren't around. Being yeah. around women uh, in like, uh, I think Destiny, you say warm, comfy places. I, I started to see, I stole that and I use that in mm -hmm. my course now. You said, was that what you said, Destiny? Warm, comfy places or something like, like that? Warm I, I stole it from Kyla Aerodive, but yeah. Was it warm? Yeah, so, so men going to more, so meaning creating better logistics is a phenomenal way to get laid on a regular basis. If you were Hugh Hefner's friend and got invited to the Playboy Mansion every week, you're just mm -hmm. gonna get laid more. But that, uh, that access, is a form of status. Like, Corey, when you come to Vegas, I'm gonna take you on stage at Access. When we're up there, you're gonna notice that every girl there is just fucking nice to you, because she's like, how the fuck did this guy get up here? 
And so yeah. she assumes status on you. And so because of that, you just have a better chance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Status is, no, yeah, no, status no. is one, of the, one of the things that goes into the attraction formula. I think there, when, when you said, Corey, is it just status that factors into it? It sounded like you were just kind of reducing all of attraction down to status, which is, I mean, if you verbally wanted to put it that way, you could put it that way. But it, when we think about status, when we define it in terms of like, how elevated are you? How able are you to exercise power in your local social group and everything? I think that's just one element. There are a lot of guys who are really low status, but physically attractive. There are got a lot of guys who are like in prison. It's hard to get lower status than that, but there are women writing them love letters. There's, there's other elements that I would put outside of status that go into attraction that, that determine what is being chosen. That is, I mean, <laughs> I feel like I don't, I'm not sure how far we've got off the topic. It's like it keeps saying, "Is Evo Psych legit?" At the bottom of the screen, are we still there? No, <laughs> we, we move on. Just, we move yeah, on. We call it came to consensus. But I want to. Yeah. So, yeah. right? Yeah, some, I, go ahead. Th thanks. Yes. Yeah, so for Evo, is Evo Psych legit? It's like I think Evo Psych would say that there are there are certain things that appear as attractive status is one of them like height is one of them like physical symmetry is one of them muscularity is one of them these things are you know that's what i'm trying as hard as i can to write into my charts that i do i'm trying to put these things into what is it that like sexually arouses women and what is it that makes them view you as a long-term partner I, I think status is just one of these things and then there's a bunch of other things that can stimulate physical attraction to, to, well, for women to want to engage in like pregnancy type behavior <laughs> guys i want to i want to ask this question to kind of uh nail this down so okay i'm gonna ask everyone on the panel what percentage of a guy's success with women do you think boils down to these following factors just give me like a rough percentage for each number one is going to be looks physical attractiveness includes like fitness and all that height uh facial structure number two is going to be money and number three is going to be game or social skills, right? I want to leave status out of the picture temporarily because I feel like status mm. is a massive amplifier. So I think that like status is like you can't even put status in this category. Uh, but we can we can add it on later on. But what do you guys think is the breakdown based on those three things? In terms, just a rough percentage of how much that contributes to guys attracting us when it comes to women and success overall with women. Let's we'll start with you, Michael. Um. Wow. I wanted to go last. Uh, okay. So I, we can go, yeah. you can go last if you want. Okay. Because you went first last time. Corey. No. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I'm assuming this all has to add up to 100%. And you mentioned looks, height, money, game. Yeah. Uh, well, so I can't, like, uh, yeah, I guess I'll go with the rules. But I would prefer sort of a, it's context dependent. But, like, yeah. So I would say looks gets you in the door. And so, like, that's 60%. Uh, and then, like, you know, I would say game is, like, whatever the other, pretty much, like, 40 or, like, 30%. As in, in my experience, like, Hyder Money has, and, and I'm not particularly tall. Like, Hyder Money has, like, virtually no factor. In my experience... Uh, as, but I've never been rejected by those criteria, but I also don't know what's said behind my back, but that's never been an issue for me. Corey, uh, one, one follow-up question. Once you, you, I agree with what you said, that's, that looks gets you in the door. Once you're already in the door, let's assume that you're already in the door. These, all these girls found you attractive or at least attractive enough. At that point, how much of a role does it contribute? Uh, yeah. So th at that point, uh, after the looks part, I, I think game, it's like pretty much like 80%. And then it's like height and money, like 10% each or something to that effect. Yeah, uh, Destiny? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, obviously, we can talk about any of these at length for how you'd qualify, but I would say probably 25, 75. So 20% on physical appearance, 5% on money, and then 75% on social skills. I would probably agree with that. Uh, home math? Mm -hmm. um, I included height in looks. I said looks is 60, game is 30, and money is 10. Okay. Uh, and Michael? I think if you're in Miami, then the money is worth more. So I would go more with what Homath said, because I was going to say the same thing. I think game could be 60, 70, 80 percent. But I think if you're in a place where it, it, here's the thing, living in Las Vegas, I meet women who are only interested in transactions sometimes. And those women, 100 percent of their attraction comes from like being able to provide resources. I know some women that just want the fucking six foot three male stripper with the tattoos who's from Australia and they don't give a fuck how much money he makes. So it just, I think it's context dependent, but I agree with kind of what Destiny said, where it's probably 75% game and 25% um, looks. Women, we've seen this in every study, women do not care as much about a man's physical appearance as the other way around. Okay, fair enough. Uh, does anyone want to expand on this a little bit or disagree with what someone said before we move on to the next thing? I mean, uh, do, 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 go ahead. I would just yeah. expand game as just like broader social skills. I don't really like the term game, but just, yeah, I think social skills uh, sure, yeah. are critical. Uh, 
And I think, largely speaking, again, in my experience, like men tend to lack in the social skills department. Yeah, I would agree so, with that. I call that smoothness in, in my system. Smoothness, yeah. Yeah, um, I would, um, I forgot the point I was making because that was such a good point. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, what I was going to say is men suffer from autism. They're uh, on the spectrum more often than women are. So you're right. And also women tend to be approached more in adolescence than men are. And so they're more socially, women advance socially faster than men do. And so, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that concept that a lot of times it's just men not understanding some of these concepts. But here's the other thing, the social alignments. A man who has a lot of social alignments probably had more survivability his an, uh, the ancestral period. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why women would find him more attractive. I remember a guy who's funny, was, yeah. a, guy, a guy who's funny would show intelligence and probably the ability to, to garner friends, which makes his sur pairing up with him uh, a higher likelihood of, likelihood of survivability. I remember what I was trying to say. It was it long term versus short term, I think, is something that needs to be yeah. uh, paid attention to a lot. The, the, the variables that women pay attention to in short term, like, let me just feel the feeling. And if pregnancy happens, then it happens like that's there's an entirely different set of, of, of criteria that makes sense for short term pairing compared to long term pairing. So it's like you got to divide these things up into two sections and status matters a lot more in one than in the other. Yeah, I always um, draw those distinctions yeah. because people will compare sometimes women's dating standards to men's fucking standards, which I think yeah. is really inappropriate because right. I think men and women's fucking standards are very far apart from each other. Opposite, but yeah. I think men's and women's dating standards be become a lot more close to each other. And yeah. that like people will say like, oh, a man will fuck anything. True, but a man won't date anything. That's absolutely right. not true. Won't marry yeah. anyone. Yeah. 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 All right, awesome. So next portion is we're going to let my mom ask some questions. She's been listening <laughs> to this whole debate. And she has some. Uh, she has some questions. So go ahead. So I know, guys, you like have all scientific studies. You all squared away about like how men and women react in certain situations. You can predict what they do and what they're not doing. But how about? Uh, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. Okay, go ahead. So how about the <clears throat> the hormone imbalance, or how about the uh, uh, life stress events, or like? sickness in both for women and men that affect their life and you cannot, oh, you, cannot you cannot predict how they're gonna react or what actually drive them to make one decision versus another decision how did you take that into equation in your formulas so i think that's a question more for michael and homac well my mom's getting at essentially uh environmental factors that cannot be predicted like uh for example nowadays women are taking much more steroids due to mm -hmm. uh you know due to birth control and stuff like that or on the men's side there's just more much more chronic illness and stuff like mm -hmm. that going on uh, i mean men being chronically low t and just people getting sick like how does all that factor in to the uh studies that you know you've cited throughout this debate um, this, I mean, there's a couple of things as we get further and further away from a survival scenario, testosterone levels are just going to drop because you would imagine yeah. there was probably times in our history where the most robust, physically strong men probably were able to have slightly more children than people who were less robust and had lower testosterone. Well, there, there's no selection pressure for that at all anymore. Like you, it, it doesn't make any difference how strong you, you can have children. Uh, and so the, because that selection pressure isn't quite the same, you should expect testosterone levels to drop. I think that's part of the reason why, but I think it's normal. I would also wait. I think just on that real quick, the idea that like testosterone is this hugely important thing in survival societies, there's probably almost no truth to that whatsoever. As long as you're in like the 100%. reference range of men. No, absolutely not. If you go and you look, cause you said it earlier, men never hunted on strength. Our species hunts on endurance. We walk things and run things down until they die. And if you look, if you actually look at videos of yeah. like tribesmen in fucking Africa, that still living, none of these guys look like the rock. None of these guys are like shredded yeah. with these massive pecs. I don't even know if any of these guys could bench probably not even 225, maybe not even yeah. 185 in most cases. Like these I guys do not, these guys look like lean fucking long distance runners and they can throw yeah. like what spears or weapons or whatever. So the Is idea that, that like, cause I think sometimes there's what? Is testosterone not a part of that? Yeah, testosterone, it, it, it testosterone can, I, it, it can, it can influence point. it a bit, yes. but I'm just saying that like, yeah, you yeah. don't need like a 950 T level to be like of a distance not. runner, right? It's so, not so like, I don't a, think the selection yeah. is that big. There. So there's a couple of things. So in the last like 50 or 60 years, men have gotten into weight training, which in testosterone aids in protein synthesis. And so because excessive, uh, like higher levels of protein, better protein, and then all the weight training, that's why guys look like the rock. But those guys who were skinny and lean, those hunters, they still might have, well, I'm, I'm guessing that they did have really high testosterone. It's just their testosterone led to assertiveness, awareness, alertness, 
And it also probably led to protein synthesis, but they didn't have the ability, like in, in none of those tribal societies, do they have the ability to procure protein like we do. So I think that's probably right. the reason why they don't look the same. Real, real quick, my mom feels like I mischaracterized her question, so I'll let her ask it again. Mm -hmm. Just try to make it more simplified. Go so, ahead. Okay, so I'm not asking about uh, guys taking hormones or women taking hormones. I'm talking about the uh, health issues and that happen to a lot of men and women that <clears throat> their uh, hormones yeah. uh, imbalance and yeah. that affect their attitude, their relationship, and their health. And, and, and in terms of like in in general that they they cannot be programmatically uh, put so, into your equation. So health, yeah, health I, I, is yeah. essentially affecting <clears throat> someone's hormones levels and affecting how they function. Yeah, okay. I, I think the the way that the modern world affects us and affects our health is one of the. It's like a very fundamental part of what I talk about. That things are different now than they have been historically, and that's affecting things like uh, j our bodies and our hormones, and that affects our perceptions. It affects the ways that we pair with each other and the way we interact with each other. One of the things I'm kind of trying to do is remind people that we're a little off kilter. So the way that your brain is sort of wired to perceive the world is you're looking for people that are not there anymore because we're, you know, men are having such low testosterone. We're at so such low activity and we're staying inside all the time. You're, you're having people develop and grow up who are not fulfilling the expectations that we have built into our like lower brains. That's, I think one of the major issues that's leading to these imbalances that we're seeing, like we're seeing a lot of like more men unable to get attention and, and uh, women clustering around the ones who still can fulfill the expectations that are built into the um, instinctual brain. Corey, I'm curious as a, as a biologist, do you have any, is this something you look at at all about the difference of hormonal rates with men and women, birth control, stuff like that? Uh, well, so yeah, not, uh, not birth control specifically, at least myself, uh, but like, yeah, as a biochemist, I'm obviously concerned with hormones, uh, and mm -hmm. well, so, but I, I'm aware of sort of, uh, the trend and the research may be showing whatever decreases, um, in testosterone levels in men. I haven't delved deeply into the research, but I'd be curious to know, like, if, if you happen to know, like, is that controlled for in terms of like, you know, low testosterone is also correlated with like your know, overweight and obesity. Uh, and so yeah, I don't like, know. That's a good point. Yeah. So the uh, aromatase, that's, that's such a great point. The aromatase. So as people get fatter, for those of you who don't know, if you take exogenous testosterone or if your body produces testosterone from your testicles, the, if you're, the more body fat you have, it aromatizes that testosterone into estrogen. And so now what's happened is the fat is like sucking out some of the testosterone that you could have been using for protein synthesis in order to build bigger muscles. And so you're right. And, and, and it's a, it's a cycle. Then you end up with that. If you guys have ever been to a bar, you see that guy at the end of the bar with the big old man boobs drinking a beer. Like that mm -hmm. is the end. Like the, that's what happens at the end. Your body, your body fat is taken on all the testosterone. And so maybe that could be the obesity, maybe another reason. It's a great, yeah, point. That's, reason I don't actually like, drop. I'm just sort of hypothesizing and speculating uh, where like, Again, I, I'd be curious if those studies actually controlled for that or if that's been looked into because I can see that yeah, as sort of an alternate explanation. Um, hey, but yeah, go ahead. So so I was curious, just from Destiny and, and Corey, so there's there's some studies. Uh, Gad Sad talked about this the other day um, on one of his interviews. Um, he's a professor from, uh, he went to Cornell and he's a professor at Concordia University in Canada. And he was, he was talking about the idea like during uh, the woman's maximal fertile period, they do more to make themselves look better. And there have been studies and these studies have been replicated. Do you guys think that that would be, do you guys believe in that? Do you think that's hokum? Like what, or, or and why do you think that it would be Corey? Uh, well, I, I can, so based off how you described it, I can believe it at face value. I'd be curious to know in terms of like what metric they're using to measure like whatever increase in looks or make themselves like whatever look pretty. Mm, yeah, that's good. That's pretty subjective. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but I, I can take it as face value. I can believe it and it's replicated. Like, yeah, I have no reason to dispute it. But I'd just be curious, well, the devil's in the details, for, just as that testosterone, for, I think the devil's in the details. For, from a psychological standpoint, though, why do you think women would do that, though, when they're more maximally fertile? Oh, uh, well, I, I assume whatever to attract a mate or attract a partner. or. To, but to but no one taught them to do that. That's what I'm saying. It's like it would it'd probably be like some genetic artifact. Uh, I think that may be a little, bit, a little bit of a leap to say that no one taught them to do, like, I don't know how the study was but, conducted, but I, dur like, but during I, their, I, like maximally fertile, do you understand what I'm saying? Like girls aren't like, Hey, I'm maximally fertile today. Let me put on some red lipstick. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I don't, I think women are definitely taught to, to maximize their looks in general, but like the fact that they do it more when they're maximally fertile. Uh, yeah, I, I can believe that. Uh, but again, I'd be curious to know how, how that's quantified specifically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, and I, I agree with just the overall broader point of like, at the end of the day, like I aware, I'm, aw I'm aware that probably 90% of my behavior is like unconscious or subconscious and I'm mm -hmm. whatever on autopilot to some respect.
Another question my mom had, I'm just going to sum it up for her, is mm -hmm. environmental factors. So, for example, let's say there's a war going on that changes social attitudes. Let's let's say, for yeah. example, like uh, the Ukraine war, right? Like, does that like how much of a role does that play into, uh, you know, like Evo site as it relates to dating in the Ukrainian women or just the more general things like uh, that are more on a micro level, like something that happens in a woman's life, some kind of trauma or something along the lines of that. How, like, for example, let's say she gets sexually assaulted or raped. Like, does that then completely throw all these theories out the window? Because then you can't really predict her behavior, or is there a different model that needs to be used? So I guess as the question is, is like a lot of this, I think it relies on the nature. You know, nature is the main component. But how much of a role does nurture play? And then how do you account for that? I think it's like I, I think it's like the play-doh versus how you shape it. It's like the clay versus what you make out of the clay. We're born with a certain material uh in our our conscious biological behavior and then your experiences and the way you live shape it so in the in the example of like a war going on that would be a lot of men getting tested at once women put men through tests and sometimes men get tested by the environment or by you know social factors or wars or whatever happens and women judge them by that that's one of the things that's always going on these these factors can become more or less important depending on context Um, I have an answer here. So there's a great book on this called The uh, Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. And he goes over the concepts of people who either become paralyzed and what happens to their happiness levels. It'll drop off precipitously and then eventually come back up to like where they were before they were paralyzed. And they do the same study with people who won the lottery. So their happiness levels go up for a short time and then they come back. So there, there almost seems to be like this genetic level of happiness, like this standard level of happiness that happens. Uh, the part, hold on. The, the, oh, yeah. So the point is, if all of a sudden tomorrow I say, hey, Destiny, like I gift Destiny $50 billion, Destiny's not going to go kill himself. It's one of these situations where there's firmware in his brain. It's like, okay, I have $50 million. This is fucking awesome. But it's like the change in environment is not so drastic that he wouldn't be able to deal with it, which means our firmware had the ability to deal with a high status, plentiful lifestyle and a low status, scarce lifestyle. Does that make sense? And you'll see this in, a, in somebody's lifetime. They'll be wealthy and then they'll be poor. You'll see this during different times. And there's, there's programming in your head for these are good times and these are bad times. And so the answer to what you're saying before is some of those people in Ukraine were probably living good, having a great time. And then a war happened a different part of their evolutionary psychology, a different line, different lines of code were now enacted. Does that make sense? So that I think that's what it is. Evolutionary psychology is not like one way to act throughout your entire life. You come out with a certain amount of programming and then in the programming, you de you're determined, okay, I was born in Sub-Saharan Africa, fuck, or I was born in Djibouti, or I was born in North America. Like it just, it just depends on like your circumstances. I was born with two parents, one parent, missing legs. There's just different things. And I think because the homo sapien is, is so robust, we can live without our parents. We have two hemispheres of the brains, two eyes, two hands. Humans are robust creatures. I think uh, we have the ability to deal with really good times and really shitty times. I think we have the programming for both. What if uh, we take something like COVID, right? Like, uh, I mean, that probably, at least for a time period, definitely affected dating practices. Uh, like, how would Evo Psych take into account some massive pandemic like that? Yeah, so... so People were isolated from one another. As I said before, I think the apex of human existence is men com is completing tasks with, with other people and, uh, and having a family. And when you're separated from that, I think people would suffer from depression more. That's what evolutionary psychology would predict. And that's what mm -hmm. we saw, I think. Well, I, I, I noticed, uh, sorry, go ahead, Corey. Oh, I just want to maybe build off it because you mentioned depression. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you might know the research better than I do, uh, but so uh, depression, there appears to be like this uh, pretty strong genetic component uh, and it like, it seems to be pretty robust uh, and sort of like conserved over evolutionary history. Uh, mm. And I'm curious, like, what would be your explanation of like, why, why do we have this behavior of like depression? I've seen some of the hypotheses put forth on Evo psych. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're like, I would say like they're really stretching, even like postpartum depression of like, this is, you know, after the, the woman has given birth. Um, and it's like, you know, you're increasing the chances that your offspring will not survive. Uh, and I'm curious again, how'd you explain that? And I, but I've seen Evo Sykes were like, make the stretch. Uh, but again, you might know the research better than I do in terms of trying the, to the first part of the, the first pressure. part of the question. I'm, I'm trying uh, to as in like it? depression, like, why is it that we okay, pretty yeah, much yeah, like for, for depression sure. is conserved over evolutionary history in humans? I, I have it. The, the only things I've seen on depression, Satoshi Kanazawa wrote a book, uh, it was called, um, why beautiful people have more daughters. And he goes into some of the reasons why depression happens. The problem is this, right? There's some people out there who think that if I just accomplish goals, date beautiful women, make a lot of money, 
fuck whoever I want, and then I'm just successful, that depression will be cured. And it's really hard to determine whether or not that's true or not. I know for some people, there's a clinical depression where there's literally neurochemicals that are not firing correctly or receptors that are not working correctly. And because of that, you are suffering from depression all the time. But I don't know how much of it, and I don't mean to be conspiratorial here, was pharmaceutical companies saying, you need this, this Pro Prozac in order to feel better. And instead of going out and getting laid and making more money. I don't know which is which. And if the if the latter is the case, which is a lot of male depression could be cured. Like again, if you look at suicide rates in the military, they're really high. And if you look at all those men who commit suicide, they live in places like Clovis, New Mexico and Altus, Oklahoma. There's no women around. So mm -hmm. like, could depression be a neurochemical thing that's just genetically, uh, uh, like people have the ability to get it just like prostate cancer. Not everyone who has the proclivity to get prostate cancer will get prostate cancer. Or, or is it something where it's like it could be cured in a lot of cases if people would just get off their fucking ass and go do something? And I just think about my ancestors. And again, I'm not being scientific here. I'm just, just a thought experiment. No, I'm thinking about my ancestors. Which one would be rewarded more? The one who went outside and killed the meat no matter how he felt about it and came back to a cheering tribe when he they brought back a new protein source or the man who stayed in the cave and felt sorry for himself? And I just think that that's part, part of where depression comes from. And it's hard because I've been in a situation where my father passed away. I didn't want to get out of bed. It robs you of all your energy, man. It really does. I had to put a, a, one of my animals down. Bro, I've never, I, I'm a 46 year old man. I was crying like a baby. I, had to, I watched this animal die in my hands. And it's one of these things where I will tell you, I suffered from whatever you want to call it, what I felt depression. And I didn't want to get out of bed. And, but the thing is over time, it gets easier. This is a really tough one. I know was that Andrew Tate says like, there's no such thing as depression. And he, he later mm -hmm. on, he went over to clarify saying, I'm not saying that there's no such thing as depression. It's just, I won't allow myself to believe it. I don't know. I don't know. That's a really tough one. I don't, I don't know exactly the reason. What I do know is that in my personal instance and in an instance with most of my clients is that when they go out and accomplish things, I've just noticed so many men who were depressed and then they got a girlfriend and then they weren't depressed anymore. I've just seen it yeah. too many times. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the transparency and honesty. Uh, yeah. And here is where, like, uh, I'll bring in my perspective. This is where I think, you know, Evo Psych tries to, like, really stretch or, like, sort of a post hoc rationalization where one of the hypotheses yeah. that I've come across, like, let's say from Evo Psych, Evo Psych field, is like, yeah, to explain depression uh, is like potentially that's actually. Uh, you know, it's adaptive of like to socially isolate yourself of like as some sort of infection control of like there's an infection. Ooh, okay. Uh, it might yeah. actually be some sort of evolutionary adaptation to like socially iso isolate yourself. And we also see this correlation with uh, depression and inflammation and inflammation is part of the immune response. And so, but there's no, at least, at least from the ding that I've done, there's no actual research to ground that of like, this is just a hypothesis mm. that they're sort of like running with uh and it yeah. seems to be gaining some traction yeah, yeah I, I don't think there's i don't think there's anything in the evolutionary psychology uh, literature that states this is definitively why depression exists but we can just put out you know hypothesis but eventually at some point we have to build the building that's, yeah, that's, no, that's that's kind of well i think something about. that you have to be careful with too is like not everything is an evolutionary adaptation. Like things can be byproducts of other adaptations. It could be that things like depression uh, or things like ADHD or other types of uh, neuro deficient diseases or whatever aren't things that are designed by evolution, but rather they're the byproducts of other things that are designed by evolution. And in different environments, you might see flaws that expose themselves as a result of um, the, the environment changing so dramatically. For instance, mm -hmm. like a lot of different things happen to your body when you become obese. But nobody here is suggesting that like, yes, like the body becomes inflamed and your testosterone levels drop as an evolutionary adaptation to becoming really fat. Well, we wouldn't say that. We would say, well, becoming really fat is probably just something that there wasn't a lot of evolutionary pressure for for anything. Yeah. Um, so things that happen to your body are bad when you get fat. And mm -hmm. there's not really an evolutionary explanation for it other than there were no pressures and just bad things happen to break down. I also think it's really important when we talk about things like depression that um, unfortunately, because all of these words get used interchangeably, um, being de being depressed has nothing to do with like the clinical disease of like depression. Being sad mm -hmm. is not depressed. Like having a dad and a mom and, a, and all of your animals or losing all your money or whatever, none of these things, none of these amount to depression. These things are sadness. Sadness can be temporary, it can last for a long time, but it's fundamentally different than um, I think things like depression or other sorts of uh, uh, like mental mm -hmm. diseases or disorders. I think it's important to realize not to say that the solution for them couldn't be similar and that like going out and being active yeah. or having friend groups or getting good sleep can help you know write your mind in other ways but i think well, it's important to separate yeah, the two. i mean the I, sleep I would, one I, is such a big one the sleep one is so underrated yeah you're absolutely right yeah i i would i would say that the, the depression is not necessarily i i'm not I'm not sure if i got this right but it's like i don't think it's encoded for in evolutionary psychology like there's a reason that we have depression i think it's rather that women judge men by their susceptibility to depression 
that people judge each other by their susceptibility to it. One thing I noticed during the COVID lockdowns, as we brought up a minute ago, is that, I mean, that affected people psychologically to such degree they changed their behavior in really profound ways. One thing I noticed is that women were more likely to judge men by how affected they were by it. I saw that just in my personal life, a lot of women gave more credit to men who were willing to like violate the, the suppressive conditions that when a guy was like willing to violate lockdown to go see her, it was like, a, that was a plus. Mm. And it's like, that's a, uh, uh, here's a guy who's not obeying, you know, what he's told. This guy is doing what he wants. It's a but what in the, isn't this true for everybody? Is this even like a gendered thing? I think it's more true for women judging men's strength. I don't think that men necessarily look at women like, oh, she's violating lockdown. That's hot. You it's don't think not to like, I, like for my girlfriend, when I was in high school, a lot of that fucking had to happen with people sneaking out of each other's houses and shit. I don't know if I would have dated my high school girlfriend or if she would have dated me if neither of us were willing to sneak out at night or right, but, you know, but, before but, school. Like, sure. But did that but did that make you more horny for her? Like meaning you had more access to her sexually, but like did that make you hornier for her because she was willing to take that chance? Meaning like yeah. let's just say you guys lived as neighbors and you could do it without sneaking out. You probably still would your sexual attraction for her would have been the same. What he's saying is like it's the guy who like yeah. rides the motorcycle cycle takes the chance tells yeah. the bouncer to go fuck himself like those guys get there's a little bit of pain yeah. of like it's the guy of, who of overcomes. masculine yeah it's the guy who overcomes it's not the girl who overcomes that's hot to the guy it's the guy who overcomes that's hot to the girl that's uh, that's how Wait, i that, saw could, evo psych play into well, that couldn't that just be reinterpreted as just like the desire is so strong that whatever a lockdown is not going to stop me and that extra desire is i like, mean i don't active. see any i don't see any reason not to put it that way like if yeah. a girl feels so special that you would put yourself at risk of uh, whatever lockdown rule for her she would go oh my god he really he really wants this that's amazing yeah Oh, well, the other thing I want to say, the, the term for it is like, so for instance, uh, our ancestors did not have access to the levels of fat and sodium uh, and carbs that we have today. So the, the, the term is evolutionary mismatch. So it's like we're not designed for some, like for instance, uh, Dunbar's number, the concept that uh, tribal bands were about 115 to 150 people somewhere in that area. And you'll notice that military units are around that same size. When you get above that number, your body, your mind cannot keep all the faces in, in your hard drive. Eventually, like there's too many people, mm -hmm. like there's so many people, you know, over the course of your life. And that's an evolutionary mismatch because you normally during the homo sapien experience, you weren't you didn't have the ability to possibly have sex with a thousand women or see a thousand women on social media or see non contextualized acts of, of sexual intercourse constantly through pornography. These are evolutionary mismatches um, that happen. And so we're just not designed for some of those things. Gotcha. Let me let me just quickly read a few super chats and we'll kind of start wrapping up. Uh, for evil psych application dating, common temptation is when individuals mistake general behavior for universal behavior, generate people's actions, their own lives, occasionally creating self fulfilling prophecies. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. What do you guys think about that? I agree. I mean, I definitely like yeah. you guys are not wrong about like I am in Destiny. You know this. I'm the I'm a huge proponent of us stopping in this space, chastising women. I don't. A girl can have a 900 body count. I don't hate her. I just don't want to date her. We got to yeah. learn to start being a little bit more discerning without being judgmental. That's me. I just, just the whole like red meat. Like I knew when I was super excited to come on today because I respect the two of you. I, Corey, I just met you today, but I respect the two of you a lot. And I was excited to come on because we were going to have a conversation that wasn't full of red meat. And so I really love the fact that we're able to, to have this conversation and just be more open minded. And this won't go as viral as us screaming at women. Unfortunately, right. that's the way the hmm. algorithm has has screwed us up. Um, I think this this question in particular from Toff or TOF, it, it, it's it's you know it's something that we talked about several times tonight, which is the truth that's produced through the lens versus the way that it's applied. And I agree, like I wholeheartedly agree that the way that it's applied is very often unhealthy and unintelligent. I don't know how to mitigate that, but I don't think that it mutes the truth that is produced through the lens. I think it's a, a very useful and viable you know way to look at the phenomenon all right unless anyone has anything else to add i'm going to go to the next super chat so it says for me at the end of the day red pill win because they pattern match creating step-by-step -step strategies to overcome dating sticking points blue pillars i would say be yourself which works after confidently mastering game mm -hmm. uh i would disagree with the idea that red pillars uh create step-by-step -step strategies to overcome dating sticking points it seems that a lot of their strategies are just make more money go to the gym uh don't marry thoughts but yeah anyway that's my thoughts but i'll let you guys answer this i think it's I kind think of the I... same thing that's what when you said go to the gym get jacked whatever you know 
those are those are kind of step by step strategies. Like in in a very very general sense, once you understand, you know what men and women are and what they're looking for, you have to just do the things that are being looked for. And I think that is a step-by-step -step strategy. But yeah, but like, I think the biggest elephant in the room is probably your game, your social skills. And like, I never really for see sure. any advice in the Red Pill community on how to improve your social skills, aside from like, maybe don't put up with BS. Okay, that's, yeah. not, that's not really gonna get you that far. Yeah, that's true, can't argue. Um, so, so I think it's it's one of these things where it's like up to a certain level, it's effective. I like I, this is how I feel about pickup. You, you, we've had these discussions before. I think pickup is really like if, like a one hundred is who you want to be, and a zero is where you're starting. I think pickup gets you from like zero to ten or twenty or thirty, maybe even forty. But I I personally think social circle game is what gets you to one hundred. It's the same kind of situation with the red pill stuff. If you are totally, totally lost. You keep ending up in one bad relationship after another. Women keep using you for money. You cannot figure out any of this stuff because you've been listening to bad people. I do believe there is some stuff in Red Pill that can help you initially. I, I just like, I don't like the idea of the, the concept of, and again, Rolo is one of my best friends. I don't like the concept of being Red Pill. That doesn't mean anything. Like Red Pill is just a lens with which to see certain things. But what's happened is the derivative of that is that there's a bunch of people that are like, I already don't like women. And here's here's an ideology that I can use to like express what I think, and that part I'm I'm not in favor of at all. I, I feel like it would be I, the exact what, opposite. I feel like if you're bouncing from bad relationship to bad relationship, like I feel like one of the biggest issues with modern red pill stuff is the things that they would preach you to improve on are going to be the exact types of things that are just going to get you the worst types of women that you're going to have the exact same problems with. So, for instance, if you're like, man, I've just been through so many bad relationships, what do I need to do? And some guy's like, well, you need to get jacked, you need to get rich. It's like, okay, so the only things I'm going to change about myself are to attract the same types of women I do now, except they're going to like me because of the that I look and the amount of money that I have, I don't think that those relationships are going to turn out so, any better if you don't do significant like personal overall. Yeah. So I think I think more what I mean is like the 21 red flags that Rich Cooper talks about in his book, uh, the uh, the uh, the unplugged alpha. He goes over these red flags that happen, and these are things to like not look for. Like for instance, one thing: I, women that are consistently unlucky. That's something I try to avoid. When it's they always have a victim mentality. I think that's good advice to like try to like having try to have a healthy relationship with someone who consistently has a, a scarcity mentality or a negative mentality or a victim mentality that's something that you might see as like as far as like red pill advice sure but that's Again, like going to be I'm that's not... literally true of both sides as well like i would easily advise women and every woman should know that if a guy is like oh yeah i've got like five x's they're all fucking insane that guy is sure. that's a huge walking red flag too <laughs> Pink pill, then that's the pink pill advice, right? Yeah. Or it's just common people advice. So somebody, it's the, it's literally the old adage of if you smell shit somewhere, there's probably shit. If you smell shit everywhere, it's probably on your shoe. Like I think that's yeah. yeah. I think I think what it is, it is it is that strong internal like the desire that we have as men for women, the validation for women, for sex with women, to be around beautiful women, to be around young young women. It's so strong. Sometimes it blinds us to other things and just the awareness that you might be blinded. I think that's that's what Red Pill is attempting to do. But just to build off the question um, briefly, uh, where, yeah, whatever, the blue pill and the advice of like, be yourself, I would say is also like, it's not inherently bad advice. The tricky part is like, I would say most people, even myself included, like don't know themselves. And I think the first step is figuring out who you are. Yeah. Uh, and that is a very difficult thing. Uh, and like, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but again, I don't really run these spaces, but like the blue pill doesn't advocate for like, yeah, be unhealthy and whatever, don't, cha don't uh, you know, don't have upward social social mobility or even they don't uh don't no, improve Corey, what, what blue pill would argue okay because i i have engaged with a lot of blue pillars and what they would argue is that like for example if you're someone that's uh i don't know like really awkward they would say you don't need to change that some girl will find along who likes you for you or yeah. let's say you're someone who i don't know is just like ha is like really much of like a pussy like you're just like really afraid on a day you're nervous they wouldn't say like no no some girl will come along who likes you so that's that's the problem just be yourself what it should be is that be the best possible version of yourself but yeah. you know, keep improving so, yeah be, well be yourself it's just dog shit advice for 99 percent of men who suck i don't be yourself better that. yeah but even like even just like uh, the money aspect that seems to get heavily emphasized like uh like would you actually uh like does anybody in these spaces actually desire like a partner like yeah i i chose you like for your money as in like uh, for your car and they're transparent about that like until someone else with a better car comes along i'm gonna stick with you uh like i don't think anybody would really feel secure in that I, relationship i, 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 I don't think that the advice is get more money so that you can get women the advice that, that i hear more is get more money and focus more on money than women and because women are now not the forefront desire of your life you become more attractive to those women because you become harder to attain i think that would be a more 
uh, nuanced way of describing that that strategy. Yeah, yeah I don't no, disagree no, with a, that. Lot, a lot. A lot of the red pillars believe that uh, your money or providing of your resources is a huge part of the attraction equation in a relationship or in casual sex or whatever. So, yeah. like for example, wouldn't that I be a black? Wouldn't that be a black pill belief? It's, it's no, black pillars. Mm. Black pillars don't think money matters. Black pillars. Think yeah. That, that it's all looks. It's just, it's just looks. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. you're right. Like when, you're I did, right. when I debated Donovan Trump, this was like a funny moment, but we were talking about like uh, relationships and he was saying like, yeah, you know, of course, like the girl, you know, you have to provide resources for your, uh, for your girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I don't do that. He's like, oh, well, you must have a 14 inch dick. And I was like, mm -hmm. like, that's, that's the only logical conclusion his mind could jump to is that like, yeah, there's gotta be something really weird there. Cause in his right. brain, like you have to like, you must have day, nothing about personality or anything else that uh, providing a girl <laughs> resources, essentially giving her some type of money, whether it's allowance or paying for shit or paying for trips, blah, blah. I know you're right. super against that, Michael. Uh, but that's just the ironic thing. You're not really red pilled either. I would say. But uh, I, I, I'm not against it. I'm not against it for the wife and the mother of your children. I'm not against it for a woman who's good to you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. But I'm, I'm against it. I'm against it for women who, man, I just, bro, it's just like so many times that my girlfriend and I probably shouldn't be talking about this, but like we'll, we'll bring women home and like they'll tell us, they'll hook up with us and they'll tell us stories about dudes cooking for them and buying them fucking cars and shit and they don't even sleep with them. Like that's the part that it's just like, bro, we need, someone needs to be alert to what's going on there. That's the only thing I'm saying. Um, just, just as far as it's like a klaxon, I think that that's where it's, um, it's, it's helpful or it can be helpful. Yeah, I, I think it's totally different if it's like you have a kid and like she's staying home with a kid and you're working. That's a totally yeah. different than like a random girl. I would give that woman anything. If she was staying, a woman staying home with my kid, I would give that woman anything, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's quite different. Also, another thing that I find ironic about the red pillars, this will be like last point I make on this, is that like a lot of the red pillars who talk about being like masculine are like some of the most fragile people ever. Like whenever they're put under pressure, they just crumble and yeah. like can't handle. That's why it. they. That's why they need it. That's why they you need. Have to be careful block. what you say next, because I may have to turn my camera off for legal reasons. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, I'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Does anyone have any uh, closing statements or anything else they want to say before we wrap up? I want to just I do. as an end to that argument. I just wanted to say I think that that when we're talking about just be yourself versus you know maximize your money or whatever, the the reason I don't like the just be yourself thing is it sounds like stop trying. And trying mm. is one of the things that's the most valuable thing that you can do, which is really at the that's the cornerstone of what I'm trying to promote through home math. Yeah, try. Corey, watch his videos. They're fucking hilarious. No, bro. I'm sure they're great. Uh, you will I just, kiss I, I, yourself. I'm bro. fantastic. Yeah, it's, I'm trying to tell men who are not <laughs> making it like there's a lot that you're not doing that you can do. That's a, one of my fundamental messages. There's always yeah. room for improvement when it comes to anything, woman specifically or success or whatever. There's always, always the next level, always room for improvement for literally every single guy, especially for most guys. Uh, Destiny, Michael, do you want to add anything? No, nope. I love you uh, very much. Uh, Michael? Yeah. I want to say something. So first off, man, congratulations. Home math is blown up. Home math, I think mm -hmm. our episode, our interview is the biggest one I've ever done. That's bigger Thank than you. Ty Lopez, Dan Love Vazarian, it. I think it was. Uh, I really had a great time breaking down some stuff. And I'm going to probably start looking into developmental psychology more because of some stuff yeah. that I've learned from you. Hey, yeah. I was telling my mom the other day that I fucking debated someone who debated Ben Shapiro and Alex Jones, man. So <laughs> congratulations to Destiny, bro. And the other thing is, dude, you and I have talked about this. This fucking flack you get, I wanted to get into the whole Israel-Palestine thing. And the way they come after you on Twitter, bro, <laughs> bro, I just don't know how you do it. I'm just, bro, they, they, they're vicious. But I also know this, man. You remember when we did the, that debate, the Ukraine-Russia debate, and I was messaging you like four or five o'clock in the morning? Yeah, I know I you were probably doing. I, I know you were probably doing that kind of research with Alex Jones and uh, and Ben Shapiro. So I can only imagine how much work you put into those. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I try to. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that, that, is, that is that is pretty interesting. The, I'm looking forward to seeing the Norman Fulco scene debate, as I said like 500 times. Uh, I watched your breakdown of how you think it went, and it seems like it was kind of a shit show. Yeah, it's. I mean, it'll come out probably within a week, and people can see it then. But yeah, it was dumb, like all these debates are. But you know, or that one's yeah. Millennium Days or Palestine. So, mm -hmm. for sure. All right, cool guys. Appreciate you all. Check out everyone's channel: Michael Sartain, Corey, Whole Math, Destiny. Everyone will be linked in the description. Appreciate you guys showing up. You, and you, you guys. four guys are invited to Vegas anytime you want, <laughs> man. Come to Vegas. Not I'll take you on. We'll, we'll look at we'll look at different areas of status when we go up on stage. Here okay. we bring our oh, bring, bring your mom. Hey, Destiny, are you going to come judge my bikini competition this summer? I'll think about it. Okay. Okay. All right, brother. All right. Uh, take care, guys. Bye. It's been a pleasure.